Welcome to the Great Bay's Tennis Podcast, episode 116. Tonight, uh, we're going to have a conversation with Mike Carter. Before we uh, talk about Mike and his background, let me just say a few things about Jeff Lewis. Our listeners, I'm sure, a vast majority of our listeners know Jeff Lewis from the U- from uh, YouTube, from Tennis Education, both education and entertainment. Our fact checker would have to look this up, I think, of... Uh, Known Jeff 24 years and been to 14 countries with him. Uh, Jeff Lewis Tennis. He also uh, is with OTI, Online Tennis Instruction, which is with uh, Florian Meyer and Greg Lesore. Uh, pretty sure that when they were trained, Jeff was helping me train them. But between Jeff Lewis Tennis and OTI, you could listen to Jeff online. Um, I would look up forehand spoof. Funny, funny, funny clip. This YouTube forehand spoof. But thoughts are with Jeff, ineffable. Uh, Jeff, his wife, the families, both families. Uh, words cannot define. Uh, they had a baby girl, and she was with him for just 41 hours. So our thoughts are with Jeff Lewis. Certainly puts uh, tennis in perspective, keeping the little yellow ball between the white lines. This will bring a smile to your face after mentioning such a tragedy. Mike Carter. My little brother, perhaps. Um, Carter spent five years with me. Uh, he's 60 years old. It's hard for me to believe that. I'll have to mention to him that uh, our first guinea pig at Tennis Tech, a uh, tennis program for tennis teachers that Mike started off, I think he was 18 years old. He'll fill us in. But um, Clayton Stanley was 48 years old the other day. He went on and played at uh, Texas, but he was our first guinea pig. Anybody who is connected with Tennis Tech uh, with Noah Clayton. But uh, Mike has been with the Texas Tennis Association, a branch of the USTA, for 30 years. Uh, one thing to spin off and talk to him about some extracurricular activities is a national champion, in triathlons, Ironman. We'll have to find out what specific event. One, one thing before getting Mike on the phone, uh, he's native of Ohio, but family moved to Austin, Texas, and he just loved Austin, and he wanted to get the job, all 17 sections of the USTA, um, maybe they still do, had a, um, an employee who would go to the schools and run assemblies to promote tennis. So the first time Mike applied, he didn't get the job. Second time he applied, didn't get the job. Actually, one of the times one of his classmates got the job. But third time's a charm. But when he didn't get the job the first time, I just remember, I think I have this in the right chronological order, he went to work for Dennis Vandermeer. And then the second time he didn't get the job, he went to work for uh, Vic Braden. Um, Married, two daughters, about to be a grandfather, let's get the young man on the phone. Carter, 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 it's a great name, I don't think I've ever called him Mike, you know, and they have those strong syllables, it's great just to yell out Carter. but this, I'm very sure, which our goal is to give out value that everyone will enjoy. I always love to talk to Carter. I like to just call him up and yell his last name. Let's see. Dialing for Carter. Steve Smith. Mike Carter. Great to have you on the phone with uh, Hello. where to begin. Uh, I know we're going to talk about the peas. Let's do that a little bit at the end. Uh, I love your lecture on the peas. But I tell, okay. people, I tell people all the time, when I first met you, and I call your brother Andy up, he was part of our training for a long time as well, that uh, I gave you personality lessons. But, uh, <laughs> when I met you, you couldn't smile, you couldn't laugh, Carter. With, I didn't uh, know anything. I couldn't do anything without you. Oh, Carter, Carter, Carter. <laughs> you know, I was well, not thanks very for having me on. You are a big, big, big influence in my life and in many, many people's lives, and you're great for the game, and thanks for having me on today. No problem, Carter. With, uh, you know, I was uh, lacking in confidence about my autobiography. You know, people told me I'd have to write it on a piece of confetti, but... I said, well, I got these chapters on Mike Carter, my, my memory. With, uh, but tell us, uh, I met you when you were 18, right? 
Yeah. 18 yeah. to 23. I would say one thing is that, uh, you know, people say, how, how did Smith hook up with Carter? I mean, you were a student, but uh, I would say in a phrase, you could take coaching. You could take coaching. Back, oh, yeah. Back in the day of reward and reprimand. With, yeah. Uh, I remember he, we just uh, had a coach shadow for a couple of weeks, Cale Hyatt. You know, we just, it was a very small group when he was here. And uh, I just think of the group dynamics at Tennis Tech. I remember you and I saw the movie Rambo, and uh, you're the first person to start calling me Rambo because I was teaching over 100, pe <laughs> over 100, 100 people at one time. And, 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 and all I would say to young people like yourself was go, just go. Go do this, yeah. go. But tell us about yeah. how you got connected with tennis. Let's go back to the beginning. This will be fun talking to the one and only Carter. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, back in uh, Columbus, Ohio, the suburb of Columbus, Ohio, Grandview Heights, Ohio, mom drug my booty out to a tennis court. She was taking tennis lessons at the local indoor club from a gentleman named Dick Klitsch, and he had a, a family full of really great players. I don't know if you ever heard of Jenny Klitsch, but she was on the tour. Um, she's probably, I don't know, 10 years younger than me, but 50 years old or so. And But anyway, uh, Mr. Klitsch taught my mom, and then she just fell in love with it and took the boys out to the tennis courts and made us play. And, uh, and that's how it all started, you know. Um, started going out with some buddies, you know, riding our bikes down to the tennis courts and just getting my butt whooped because I was the worst athlete in the world and, and all of that. But, uh, but, uh, I was just small for my size and that's really how we, we started off. Then we all moved to Texas and, and, uh, we were part of a country club and, uh, started taking lessons there and really getting into it. And, and it turns out, you know, once we went back to visit, you know, grandma, grandpa and all that, I went back out to the tennis court with, with those guys that would just kill me. Oh, and Oh, they had a court court in their backyard. They weren't just anybody. I mean, they, they were taking lessons too, but then I went and beat them. Oh, and Oh, so it really was kind of an interesting kind of dynamic when you kind of get away from this heavy kind of, uh, these, kids that that you just don't feel like you have any I don't know that that kind of puts you down maybe a little bit and getting away from that and kind of coming to Texas and then playing some tennis and then getting some confidence and then coming back and and uh and then getting a chance to kind of redeem myself on the tennis court with some of those guys they're they're still great friends of mine but yeah that's a that's the short side of uh of how I got started in tennis it's interesting uh I've heard experts say that seven out of 10 matches are predetermined. They're over before they start. And, you know, you don't really want to have the off factor. If you're an off someone, you know, you think they're awesome and you'll never accomplish what they do. But exactly. yeah, it, it actually, yeah, to, um, be taken out of an environment sometimes helps for sure. I, yeah. I, you got to kind of get away from that a little bit. And I was always said kind of like, when I entered my first tournament, I mean, if a kid came up and he had two rackets that were matching, I mean, I, I was down the first set already. So to your point, I mean, I, I had one racket and they had two that were matching and they had probably an outfit and I was still in cut off blue jeans. I mean, it was, it was something, you know, it, it's a, it, it's a serious big deal <laughs> no, that's funny. for some people. I just didn't have that confidence at the very beginning. Yeah, I think back when someone shows up and they don't have matching rackets, uh, the term bush league, you know, you play so far away from the city, <laughs> you're, you're, the Australian term, you're out in the bushes. <laughs> with, I'll tell you, man, if they had a racket bag too, that was like a set and a half. With, yeah, junior tennis players with um, today, I mean, it is, it's like if they don't have that bag, that's uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. We're always, always saying they need to carry mm -hmm. their bag. But actually, changing environments, one thing with that, you know, I know a lot of, there's two sides to it. You know, the, the tennis parents will not stick with a coach and they'll have a tendency to bop and shop. And um, But I always tell people, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're going to a different environment or perhaps there's better sparring partners, better competition, but you want to still stay in touch with the person, especially if they're competent, 
you know, stay, stay in touch. Let, you know, go back. It's, if it's just once a month, go back to where you started to have a video review session. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times when you go from one environment to the next, it's, 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 it's a, it's a totally different explanation and on how to hit forehands and backhands. Do you find, let me ask you a question real quick. Do you find that, that coaches are using videotape like you do? I mean, you've always been an advocate of, of videoing many, many stages of a player's experience. Are they, are they using that, that often? No, um, I'd say no, no, no. Uh, it's amazing. Everybody's got a phone in their pocket that is a video camera. Yeah, exactly. I do think, uh, you know, that's one thing with what we're trying to do, giving out free educational tennis content, is, mm -hmm. is coaches are making YouTube clips. They're putting themselves on the film or on the, you know, the social media platforms. Mm -hmm. you know, I think, say, for example, Andy Fitzell made all these uh, short Instagram posts and, and people were copying them instead of uh, saying, okay, just sharing what Andy put out. They were doing it themselves. And, and sometimes wow. certainly it would be a watered down version, but I, I don't think that people are um, using video certainly as much as they should. I mean, certainly on the other side, people, people can get, get teched out, but um, no, I'm, it's amazing that we have someone here now, for example, who's been to three big time academies and you know, he just hasn't been filmed. Uh, you know, he's mm -hmm. this academy, that academy, that academy. And, um, you know, so I think also too, is that once people are filmed, you know, then the, the machine's only as smart as, as its operator. <laughs> so Round Rock. Round Rock, Texas, baby. That's where you went to high yeah, school. Yeah, so went to Round Rock High went, went to Round Rock Middle School, I guess, when we first moved to Texas. And then, went to uh, Round Rock High School, and uh, yeah, I played number one on the high school tennis team um, from freshman year all the way through the senior year, and as you know, I I really was not that good. <laughs> was, I was a, was a your, mediocre fish in a very small pond. <laughs> your brother Andy, when you were a senior, what year was he? He was a sophomore. Sophomore. Yeah. No, and that I, was the huge. I remember we had you to battle. Be, I remember you to be athletic, and uh, despite the fact that we all pretty much had a continental grip on the forehand side, that uh, <laughs> I mean, your strokes early were not unorthodox at all. Yeah, um, but by the time you came to TJC, I believe at one time the the, the first coach Fred Niffen, who put the team on the map and they won national that championship after national championship, he was waving the American flag. And he had all Americans initially, mm -hmm. and then it turned into mm -hmm. an immigration center. I mean, two different times yeah. I, I was the uh, interim coach, and one time, both men and women, there was only one American. Uh, so it, it was, wow. it, the level was quite high too. There was players at TJC when they came over; they didn't know the difference between USC is in Southern Cal or University of South Carolina. You know, USC, yeah. and TJC it was just the alphabet soup. Yeah, um, you were actually. Um, I started Oct October one, so you were there before I was. Yeah, I was there. What I guess a, a, a semester ahead of you, I guess. No, no, um, um, you, it was. Um, you know, just one month. You were a freshman. Oh, just and, one month. Then. Okay, you were a freshman, and um, no, I mean Fred Niffin. I I spent a lot of time coaching uh, his daughter Judy. And, you know, he was looking for someone to come help him with the team. And I said, you know, I would really be interested in taking a, one class a semester, a tennis emphasis, and making a comprehensive curriculum. And Eugene mm -hmm. Allen was the president of the Board of Trustees. And, you know, he knew what I was doing as far as doing internships under different coaches. And he's the one who really made that happen. So when I came in, um, I mean, that first semester, there was a class called Water-Related Sports, and I remember going to the YMCA <laughs> and telling the director of the Y, I said, if you help me teach this class, because I didn't want to be the teacher that was one page ahead of the class, and I said, I'll develop a free program for you here. But uh, So you were there, you know, yeah, um, I do have a memory, total, total recall, but you were there f four, four or five weeks before I was. 
Yeah. And I remembered you coming in and really turning it around because we were in canoes and stuff, you know, I mean, it was kind of fun, I guess, you know, I mean, water related sports and, you know, but it's like, okay, this is not really what we're here for. This is a tennis school, you know? And I mean, that was the thing. I mean, I, I did get a partial scholarship offered to me from Niffin. I had, I treed out of my brain and beat a kid from Dallas that I don't know, I think just won state doubles or something like five, eight doubles. And, uh, and beat him in the pro set. And coach was like, okay, well, I'll give you like books and, and you come in. And then he talked to me about the tennis school. I came there, had no idea. And I was like, I am in. Keep the scholarship. I don't want to play on the team. I want to be a tennis teacher. So that was, you know, being in a canoe was a little bit weird. And you coming in and, and bringing the tennis curriculum in, that was, that was, with very uh, welcome news to many of us. Yeah, there was a class called wa- um, Parade Management. Parade Management. With Parade? Yeah, for me, a lot of people thought, well, this is going to be an easy major. So I certainly uh, went in the opposite direction to the nth degree because people were perceiving the, the mm-hmm. degree as, uh, you know, underwater basket weaving. And I said, okay, right. okay we're going to make this, this make this difficult. But actually, the students are the ones who uh, they made the rules. When I first went there, I was rec- there, there was an attendance policy, uh, attendance. The policy was recommended, you know, six classes and you're dropped. You know, uh, two tardies equals one absence. And and mm-hmm. I came in from Southern Cal, and I said, I'm not going to take attendance. But you know. Then you got to the point where we had Dennis Vandermeer come in. I know we're going to talk about Dennis. And students were sleeping in and missing Dennis's classes. So that's, that's where I, you know, I, I was humble and said, okay, I can understand them sleeping in and missing my classes. I was only a few years older than everybody. I was 26 years old. Right. And, <laughs> and uh, but yeah, we got to the point where when the bell rang, the door would shut and no one could come in. You, you were absent <laughs> when the bell rang. With, uh, uh, but for our listeners, you were there five years. I tease people and say he was there five yeah. years to get a two-year degree, but you studied at the University of Texas at Tyler. Correct. With your sense of humor. And then played uh, a little bit on the tennis team. Go ahead. At UTT? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With uh, Jason Seymour. And I can't remember the two coaches there. I'm, I'm drawing uh, a blank. J- but, Jason yeah. Seymour and Russell Morton. Russell Seymour and Jason yeah, Morton. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Senior moment. Let's say that one more time. Yeah. Say it correctly. Russell Seymour. Russia, Russell Seymour and Jason Morton. Jason Morton. And uh, they were good. I mean, they were all, all great players. Um, great, I, yeah. You know, I. it was a good experience. I played six, I think. I played one match. <laughs> and then, I don't know, then I think I got – I wasn't on the top six because again, that was, I think I might've been the only American. There was no, uh, there were two Americans on that team. Kevin, um, gosh, a a buddy of mine here, I'm forgetting his last name. uh, And, and then myself, who were the two, the two Americans, but good players. I mean, they won the NAIA, NAIA, uh, national championship that one year, you know, They, they were solid. Russell Seymour, a, a South African, he at one time was in yeah. charge of player development in South Africa. And there's so many things that he helped us with. Yeah, they came in and there was a new country club, Holly Tree. And they ran Holly Tree, but they also coached at the college. Uh, trivia, right. Jason Morton. Yeah, these guys were great senior players, won all sorts of national titles. But Jason yeah. Jason was in the chair when Billie Jean King played Bobby Riggs. Oh, my gosh. I didn't know that. Yeah. And then, you know, actually, when the movie came out, I mean, there's been a couple movies, but the most recent one, Dennis was courtside coaching Billy. But in the movie, they had um, Billy Jean King's husband. Um, anyway, oh, so, yeah. I didn't know Dennis was there. Yeah, Dennis, um, you know, he had coached Margaret Court and the, mm-hmm. the, the Mother's Day Massacre. Um Billy beat Margaret quite easily. And then, so Billy, uh, they could each have a coach on the bench. And, um, yeah. 
Lorne Kuhl was on the bench for with uh, Bobby Riggs. Interesting. And you know, my, um, my former boss, executive director for USCA Texas, Ken McAllister, was on the baseline during that match. Yeah. It's, yeah. It was play, played in Houston in the Astrodome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, huge. Huge. It did so much for women's yeah. tennis, actually. Billie Jean King. Uh, hats off to Billie Jean King for so many things. Yeah, for so many things. No doubt. Uh, Pressure is a privilege. Right before you came on, I was telling people how you just loved Austin, Texas, and I can't remember the name. Was it the school's program director? What was the name of the title back in the day with the Texas Tennis Association? Yeah, you were right. Yeah, the the school's program director, exactly. Yep. And you and wanted you that job. School. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. You wanted the job so bad. Well, so first try, second try. And I always tell people, yeah. I said, you know, <laughs> you kept hanging in there, hanging in there, and eventually you got the job. Yeah. And, 30 years yeah. later, you're still there. But with, yeah. I, my recollection is that the first time you went to uh, work for Dennis and the second time you, worked, yeah. you went to work for Vic. So that was a pretty good trade off. Absolutely. And then starting off with Riley Meyer at the All American Sports Camp that very first summer from yeah, TJC. Yeah, so talk, that was talk amazing. A bit, talk a little bit about that. Amherst, Mass. Uh, I worked for that company. And obviously that's how so many, mm-hmm. so many of the students I had, um, you know, that was, you know, an opportunity that they could pursue. They had so many, yeah. different, so many different sites up in the New England, the Northeast, um, in Florida, yeah. Florida in the wintertime. But Ryan Meyer yeah. um, should be able to rattle off the name of the town of Wisconsin, fifth grade teacher. And at one time, Nick Baltieri was in charge of the adults and Harry Hopman was in charge of the juniors. But that was, that was before... Um, I worked for All America, but I had heard so many great things about him that I had finished at a junior camp and before going to the U.S. Open, the National Teachers Conference, I volunteered and worked for two weeks for, for Riney. But he was interesting. Kind of yeah. What were your like, recollections from working with him? Um, he was one of the more level headed, calm guys that I've ever been around. He was such a, a great person to work for um very fair very smart and he was so good in a crowd i i thought i was okay at that time of speaking to a group and all that and then we we go in for every um orientation with all of the students all of the all of the campers it was an adult camp so that was an interesting part of it too, because I, I learned a couple of adult lessons at that time. That was kind of crazy, but you go in there, everybody's in the auditorium, and Ryanie just jumps up on the on the big kind of this this big table up in front of the auditorium that that professors were there lecturing on, and he would just stand up on the table and go to work. He was amazing, just the way he would look at the whole crowd, demo so everybody could see you, you know? And so that was a huge lesson for me, you know, just watching and making sure that you are doing and speaking in a way that your students and the people that are listening to you are not only engaged, but can see you and, and hear you. And um, that was just really a big moment for me, just that that small part that still sticks in my mind. But what a great experience. It was wonderful. It's certainly for a classroom, bell to bell, 45 minutes, 45, 50 minutes. That's a long time. So he was certainly <laughs> very experienced as a classroom teacher. I think it was the fifth grade yeah. that he taught for year year after year. But I, yeah, I remember the the doubles, you know, well, Winnie, when Winnie the Pooh is standing here and he just went through, he had, he had everybody's attention. One thing that comes to my mind with <laughs> Reinie Meyer and many, many students that we trained went to work at uh, that one site. They had so many courts at Amherst, Mass. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I remember once a week, it would be the tennis coaches. And it was a large, large tennis camp. That was in the heyday of the tennis boom. And that the, the tennis staff would play the kitchen staff in softball. That's the kind of guy that Reiny was, is that like, hey, let's do this. Let's all get together and play softball. Yeah, yeah, that's good. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With, tell us a little bit about uh, Dennis. I think I have one thing to always add when I think of Mike Carter and Dennis, but you know, I, 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 I think I know what it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you, listeners, uh, Dennis Vandermeer calls me up and Steven, Steven, I love Mike Carter. <laughs> and he says it twice. I love Mike Carter. I go, why do you love Mike Carter? And Dennis, the great comedian that he was, he goes, because he loves my dog. <laughs> and uh, listeners can get a visual on this as Carter gets down and he's wrestling the dog and rolling in the dirt. And the dog, the dog loves Carter. So then uh, you had to walk the dog twice a day. Yeah. <laughs> I remember we, we used to be resume tech trying to get everybody to get jobs. And uh, I said, Carter, where does it say on your resume? You, Dennis Vander, <laughs> walked his dog. <laughs> Vandermeer's dog walker. <laughs> tell us, tell us, oh, you know, tell us a little what comes to your mind with Dennis. Well, I mean, if, if there's one person other than you that have, has influenced me, even even as much um, information as I've learned from Braden and any other instructor, I really do feel like Vandermeer influenced me the most um, just from the very first time watching him do large groups. And it, and it happens to me now weekly, um, multiple times a month where I'm in large groups. I have lots of people on one tennis court and how to manage those individuals where they're all active. They're not standing in a line. Everybody's moving. Everybody's um, working on something. They're, they're, there's a purpose. And every time Dennis did anything, there was always a purpose. And there's usually way too many people on a tennis court, but he's got it wired. It's safe and, and productive. And so, huge huge deal there for me you know learning learning about that watching him do that and watching the humor and the instruction at the same time i i don't come close to what he does but that's what i try to do is at least make it enter as entertaining as, as absolutely possible and uh so that was number one so when working on hilton head at the vanderbilt tennis center um, met some of the most interesting and great guys uh, and girls on his staff there. And so it was just a wonderful experience, but, you know, not just the standard method, um, because that is in itself is just um, remarkable and everything, how biomechanically sound it is. Um, but uh, everything else, just being a member of the PTR and what he did with the PTR um, and, uh, and then all of the camps and what I've learned from him in terms of the, uh, uh, um, the standard method, basically it's, it's what I'm talking about, but it was really, really good. It's a great experience. And thank you so much for bringing him in. I mean, that, that ends up going away uh, in the, in the former years of tennis tech and not to put anybody under a bus or anything, but you know, that was the sad part about after you left, you know, it ended up being more USPTA and not any PTR. And, and that was, a, that was really sad to, to see. So anyway, huge influence in the standing here for sure. Dennis. Um, yeah. The USPTA started in 1927, PTR in 1977. The USPTA did not have a test. The PTR had a test before the USPTA. So Dennis has a test certification exam. And then at one point shortly afterwards, the USPTA slogan was best by test. Uh, so many things come to mind. I know at one time it was just you and Jennifer Roberts and she's married to yeah. Jim Morgan. So Jennifer Roberts Morgan, highly intelligent and you too. I mean, you just worked mm -hmm. around the clock and mm -hmm. there were some technical points that, you know, certainly with, with Vic and his camera work and his connection with Gideon Ariel, who, by the way, we've had on the podcast. Um, there was just some things that were definitely invalid, you know, say for example, um, how you set the hand for the overhead, what, but what the left hand does on the overhead, um, the angle, mm -hmm. the, ra angle the racket face at the bottom part of the swing, but there's far more similarities. And I remember Jennifer's mm -hmm. Jennifer question. I said, Jennifer, when uh, he comes in, 
he's going to spin your wheels and everybody else's wheels. It's just going to be amazing. <laughs> and then she said afterwards that she was just in awe of what he could do. But, you know, one thing right. about, um, you know, those, I know, I know we have some followers that um, it's, it's like, certainly the, sometimes the impression is it's Vic Braden only, and it's, it should not be Vic Braden only, you know, to take mm -hmm. Vandermeer progressions and use it with, mm -hmm. use, and use it with Braid methodology. You know, right. That's what, that's what the great base is, is you can take Welly Van Horn balance and use it with Vandermeer progressions and, you know, the Braden, you know, fact-based information with, with science. But Dennis could make people smile. Tell, tell people how he used to do this first video class on the first day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, well, the line usually was out the gym door of individuals that, that we, the instructors, would film on court. And he would, um, he, he would look, he would have his back to the TV. And as each person would come up, he would be able to say the person's name and all of their flaws in forehand, backhand, volley, and serve. And he wasn't watching the TV and critiquing at that. He remembered through the video process, everybody going through hitting five forehands, five backhands, five thirds, five forehand volleys, five backhand volleys. See you later, Alice. Next up. Okay, Phil, here we go. And then they would all come in, and he knew every name and every every flaw of all of their strokes. It was uh, amazing. So just uh, really, really something where you, you understand what kind of a genius that man is. You know, just just learning names where he would come in and yeah, uh, you know, learn people's names. And there's certainly an art form to that. You know. That's something I picked up from Dennis. If you can spread people out during stretching and, you know, you have, say, 10, 12 minutes and, you, you know, it's a group with, you know, 25, 35 people, you, you just attack it and you can learn everybody's name. Exactly. And that's a good way to put it. It's like people wonder how I do it. And, and it's so, it's work. You attack it. But, yeah, you're going to Alice and say, Alice, I like how you're stretching there. Great job, Alice. Okay, Alice, I'm going to see you next time. Okay, hey, Phil. What's going on, Phil? Nice work. Bring that, that arm up a little higher, Phil. Okay, Larry, you know, I mean, you, just, you you get it. I mean, you just work it. You attack it. That's a really great word to use. There's some tricks, too. Say, for example, if you forgot someone's name, you say, okay, everybody in here, name test, let's go. And, and then you have have everybody learn each person's name. What, what's, mm -hmm. For our listeners, one one trick is: say you're speaking to you know 30 people, and you go into the room and say, "Okay, we're gonna take a few minutes to learn everybody's name." And you know you're going left to right, first row, second row, and and obviously somebody is in the 30th chair, and that's going to be the the greatest <laughs> challenge because you have to know 29 other names. But you just you know say if I were to stand up first, I I'm Steve. And then I sit down and then you're second and you have to stand up and go, this is Steve and I'm Mike. And the third person has to go, this is Steve, this is Mike and I'm Joe. And then you're- Oh, I like that. I've never heard that. You sit in, you sit in the room and you just have to repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, but but yeah, even, even you hear adults all the time say, well, I'm not very good with names. Yeah. But what you have to do is, is people are subconscious when they're meeting someone, they're thinking about what the other person's thinking of them. And just, you just got to yeah. repeat their name. Hey, Mike. Exactly. Where are you from, Mike? You know? And, uh, yeah. It's great to meet yeah. you, Mike. With... Hey, and a little aside to that, Steve, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a more recent study of why kids quit sport is because of what they are calling not being recognized, not being acknowledged. And I feel like so many youth coaches out there, probably adult coaches as well, but this is huge for our, your listeners, in my opinion, if they're not already um, using a kid's name that often. I mean, it's what the music to their own ears is their name. And, and, um, but that, that actually started to show up on surveys of why kids quit sports because the coach is not acknowledging them. So, they might be paying attention to another, 
certain group of the kids and maybe leaving a couple others out. So it's really important for all of us to know if we care about youth sports, care about kids staying in sports, because as you probably have mentioned on other po- podcasts, 70% of all kids quit all sports and go straight back to the couch by the age of 13. Um, you know, we, it's, it's a real problem. And so that one thing right there can help, um, keep kids in sports, but also keep them <laughs> coming back to your program and buying your tennis balls and your rackets and taking your, your lessons. So, uh, thanks for letting me uh, uh, go on my soapbox on that real quick. No, I think it's great with uh, a new kid comes in, blow the whistle, everybody runs over, everybody has to be introduced to the new kid. And then the best thing you yeah. do is peer teaching is uh, just, you know, you know, we, we obviously start with film. And it's pretty extensive, but to just say, OK, you know, new new young kid comes in, Tom. And, you know, why don't you uh, hook up with John and why don't you two guys go over there and do this drill together? Uh, mm-hmm. the, uh, but yeah, there's so many powerful things to peer teaching with, with Dennis. Yeah, did you, did you, you made it to Sweetbriar, too, right? I did. Yeah, yeah. I got to drive the uh, the Vandermeer slash head van from Hilton Head to Sweetbriar and back. I mean, I was kind of like their their driver for the van. Hey, the van needs to get there. How are we going to get it? Carter, get in the van. Drive it up here. <laughs> With, <laughs> hey, how are we going to get the van back for the parade? Hey, Carter, get in the van. Drive it back to the island. It's like, <laughs> oh, I love this. <laughs> Did you get to drive the red Ferrari? I did not. <laughs> there you go, Carter. With, uh, Good know, gosh. Awesome. I know, I know Tom, Tom Gilly got to drive the red Ferrari. Amazing story is that uh, Dennis's wife, Pat, she was in a hospital in Savannah and uh, critical care. And so Dennis, uh, mm. he went with the, the, his Ferrari. And by the way, he used to tell all his students, you don't need to buy a really fancy car because then your, your clientele will think you're making lots of money that he would get in his red Ferrari. But, but Vandermeer, <laughs> uh, so he goes to this hospital spending the time with his wife and he, now there, there's some, certain times where there's no, no hours for visitors and he calls up uh, Jilly because outside the hospital women were, hospital window, there was two empty tennis courts. So uh, Jilly, he drove the van up to the, the hospital in Savannah with, ball hoppers and whatever. And Dennis started just teaching for free and had those car- courts packed. And he had Pat looking out the wow. hospital window so she could watch him teach tennis. So anyway, wow. I know that story because Jilly was the one who drove the van up, but he had to drive the Ferrari back. So, Oh, my gosh. But up at uh, Sweetbriar, did you get to – I know uh, Jim Verdick and, and Jim Lair, they came back and forth to Tennis Tech. Yeah. And – we certainly, we've had Lair on our podcast. We dedicated a podcast to him before having him on personally. Uh, we dedicated a podcast to Jim Verdick, and then we had his son, Doug, on. But yeah, I know, so you would have known them through Tennis Tech, but when you went to Sweetbriar, did you go through those, uh, I guess it was Tennis University 2 and 3? Right on, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was quite and a... And Verdick was there, and, and uh, I don't know if I remember... Lair coming in to Sweetbriar, but Jim was there for sure. Coach was there for sure. Yeah, he was there the whole summer. But, but uh, yeah, at least once or twice during the summer, uh, Jim Lair would come in and do a a one week mental toughness camp. Like, he was amazing. Which we, you know, we and completely... I think has now has uh, Lair revised the sixteen second cure. Oh, he may have. Um, I just, I saw a video of that just recently. I didn't know if you had seen that. You know, he's written 17 books um, with, yeah. you know, it, it, you know he, he talked to us about the podcast we dedicated to him is that, uh, you know, some of those things he's not doing anymore where he's actually the mental toughness camps where yeah, you know, he's, he's more of a consultant now, a lecturer, but he, mm-hmm. where he's actually running a camp where making kids play where they switch, switch rackets or doing the Jimmy Connors thing where Jimmy Connors would pour water over his leather grip and start, you know, really drying the, the grip out. So he pours water and before the match has even started, 
and they would ask Jimmy, why do you do that? And he said, it's going to be wet when it's important. And, you know, all those little things just add up. And, you know, then he, yeah. he do things where you break into teams and, you know, the, uh, the, the one team would try to distract the, the other player. And it was crazier than a college tennis match with all the screaming. It's mm -hmm. many, 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 many yeah. clever things to uh, make people better mentally. With, yeah. So then with Braden, your experience in Braden was not in California, though. It was, uh, you went to California, though. I remember you going out there, taking you with me, the Cota de Casa. Yeah, yeah. So you went through yeah. the, the program that uh, Vic had, the United States Tennis Academy mm -hmm. in California. You can talk about that, but also, too, then you worked for him in, in, in uh, Germany. Yeah, that was fun. The Cota de Casa was amazing and, and great experience. And I can't remember the other student that was with us there. I can't, you, me, and I think another kid that was there, but um first kind of time to just be on site where it all happened and see the amazing ball machine um center that he had and um the research center and and going through hands-on classes and then taking the test and then getting your grade back and you pass and it's just all such an exciting time you know Cota de Costa was such a, a neat experience and seeing that and uh and then, thankfully, because of you, really, is, is having that opportunity to work for Vic um, in Germany um, at a couple of different sites. And then also, um, I guess it was like a week-long camp that we did in Cape Cod once that, that he or somebody selected me to go help him with. And what a great experience that was. But Germany, as a, what, a sophomore in college on my summer uh, vacay, you know, getting to go over there and seeing literally like four corners of Germany, you know, at those different tennis camps. And, and thankfully you, you hooked us up with a, a, a gentleman that knew how to speak uh, German. And so we went through a crash course in tennis German, how to get people in a line and talk about loop swings and forehand grips and uh, base knuckles and everything in, in, in Deutsch. And, uh, and, uh, and then, and then just working, uh, every day of the week teaching tennis, you know, it was just really, really wonderful. Yeah. To, to back up, uh, from photos, I remember when, when you went to Kodo, there was a group of like 10 from the tennis tech. Program. Oh, 10 of us. Yeah. Okay. And it was, uh, the, 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 uh, it was during the semester break. And I remember that we stayed not only to go through the the, the training for coaches, but then we stayed and went through the camp as well. So we were, we were out there a good amount of time where you had people sleeping bags on the floor. And, you know, it was, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was really for us, I mean, back in the day, listeners, uh, pretty big time to be around Dennis Vandermeer and Vic Braden. People have to realize that, that pretty much they were both rock stars in the world of tennis at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of photos, um, you know, I, have a photo up, uh, some people were hanging up photos. I should, should say, hang that photo up. And it's one of Roger Crawford, who we had on, disabled in all oh, four man. Of them. And you're actually, you're actually in that photo with, with Roger Crawford. Uh, oh, really? The, uh, but back to Vic, um, I mean, Roger, that's an amazing story. If you should go to listen to his podcast and play division one college tennis. Um, yeah. You know, it'll get people to stop complaining, stop whining. Stop, stop feeling exactly. sorry. Stop feel sorry for yourself. But with yeah, yeah, with Vic, uh, I mean, he's just been ahead of his time. He still is. I mean, you know, physics is is relevant. You know, it's it's gonna it's gonna stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. Caveman Deutsch. I think it actually um, <laughs> certainly your personality very animated anyway and gifted with being in front of people, but. Um, teaching tennis where you can't converse and actually it created a really unique situation because there was empathy. Um, the teachers were learning German while the students were learning tennis. It was a two way street. <laughs> yeah. Always had a pen and paper ready to go to take more notes. And it was really caveman how we were speaking. I had a decent vocabulary, you know, I, I knew a lot of words, but the sentence structure is so different um, in German that uh, 
you know, you just, you're, you're like saying the sentences backwards because you're just applying the English format sentence structure, but using your German vocabulary. It was pretty ridiculous, but uh, everybody got it. And, and that was the thing. You know, I mean, there's just so many more ways to teach anything besides just talking it out. You know, I mean, that was where your perfect demonstration really had to be a, a on point. And then you're moving around all of your students and, and actually physically helping them understand the shape of the swing, you know? And so, um, you know, that, that's real active teaching. You're not just sitting behind the ball cart, spouting words and feeding the ball. You're, you're getting people to drop hit. They're hitting off cones. They're, they're shadow swinging. You're back there working it right there with them. So you can, you know, set up the ball machine and then you're working right there with them and helping them, um, just dial it in, you know? So, yeah. Dear, dear Doss with hope, <laughs> hope, keep hope in your knock housing. But again, my memory is that your, your experience, I know you later went back and worked with Danny Cooper. He had set up his own tennis school in Berlin. Yeah. So he had another experience in Germany, but uh, yeah, I've always been envious of the students that went and spent several years and actually became fluent in German. When I was there, yeah. um, I can't say a phrase. I tell students sometimes, I don't, don't be offended, but you play tennis like I speak German. And I say, you know, <laughs> I, I can't say one phrase without making five mistakes. Ich brauche ein Übersetzer für Deutsch sprechen. <laughs> but you know actually um you know to this day i mean i feel like i could go out and give a private tennis lesson in german one-on-one -on -one, but when you're out there with a group it's like whoa this is not easy this yeah is, this is a challenge yeah yeah but there's still that's uh, pretty impressive Steve. nice work there no, good. no 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 it's not impressive at all <laughs> actually there's still uh, all these years later so i would have met you in 1981 so we're looking at 40, mm -hmm. 41 years later, um, there's still a number of students that, you know, went through the tennis tech experience that are still in Germany. Because at the time, I mean, yeah. it was uh, when Becker and Graf, you know, they were coming up the ladder and they're among the best players in the world. And Germany is such a wealthy country. And the the boom, the tennis boom in Germany, you know, our, our tennis boom was really in the 70s and theirs was in the 80s. So. Mm-hmm. So tell us about, you know, um, I guess you could talk a little bit about tennis tech. I mean, you're five years there, so you were a student. And that, that was certainly a challenge to, um, next thing you know is, and I tell people that you, you guys were grossly overpaid. I think you were paid $600 a semester. I mean, it was just, talk about spirit, you know, the spirit, the love of the game. Um, I mean, I, I know I was paid $13,000 a year. Um, oh, wow. It, it was, you know, and then certainly I supplement my, <laughs> how I was supplementing my income was greater than my, what I made uh, as a faculty member. And then we had the summer. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, wasn't even concerned about the money. Actually, I took the job and the Rich, Richard Minner, the dinner, the, the dean that I worked on her said, don't you want to know what you're going to be paid? I said, oh yeah, yeah. I had no interest in what I was going to be paid. Um, but tell us a little bit about tennis tech. So, you know, uh, not only being a student, but then just overnight, you're a former student teaching students. That's not, that was not an easy position to be in. No, but it was, it was good. And I don't feel like, I mean, you just to back up, you, you called me when I was off at another school um, teaching and I not enjoying it all that much and getting that call saying, Hey, come back. And, I mean, that was just music to my ears and, and, and got to thank you again for that opportunity to, to make it back to Tyler, Texas and, and do what we were doing, you know, so, uh, enrolled at, at UT Tyler and, and, uh, and got that going, but yeah, just, uh, a lot, a lot of fun and, and a lot of good, you know, it's a bit frustrating, you know, I, I feel like, like you said, there were some of those individuals that would come and and thought that they were going to skate through, you know, that it, it, this was going to be the easiest degree plan I've ever gone through. And 
And that was, you know, definitely a challenge and, and, and frustrating to, to see that and everything. But, um, you, you certainly got them in line and shape, uh, shape them up and everything. But, uh, the, the program was huge. I mean, you grew it to, you know, 70 to what, 90 different students at that point. And, uh, it was just a, a, a really, really good experience. I think we the, the most we had was 108, but we had people from uh, so many states and so many countries. It was very international. Right. Very international. It was a yeah. You know, we we could say we were the best, but we were we were the first and we were the only. So it was it was easy to be the best. Yeah. You were the first and you were the only. <laughs> Ferris State uh, started a couple of years later. With, but no, I think being a student, then you have to you know you certainly have to rap, reprimand someone who you're you would have been all of what. 20 years old, right? Yeah. Yeah. But we had, we had people that had, uh, you know, made career changes or already had a master's degree or were retired from the military. So it was a pretty diverse group. Too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There was Not some, just youngsters out of high school. Yeah. It was definitely some older individuals for sure. With. And not all great players, Steve, you know, I mean, um, it was interesting how people just saw the ad and decided to come in. And some of your best, I, I can't remember her name, Sheila. I think she was so good at instructing, but it just goes to show you, I mean, that you don't have to be a player to be able to be a coach or to be a, a, a good instructor, you know? I mean, some, some of that, some skill helps. Absolutely, especially maybe to get people to even to come in the door. But the proof is when are you getting that individual to hit a ball better and all that. And I can't remember her name, but she was, I don't think she ever hit a tennis ball when she walked in, but uh, she uh, learned how to play and she was a great instructor, a great asset to the program. Well, I think with uh, Sheila Nielsen, that's her maiden name. Yeah. Sheila Nielsen. Yeah. And yeah, she had not played tennis or played other sports. But she basically hit the ball better than, you know, anybody on either team. But, you know, people wouldn't understand that. Of course, you know, you had to toss the ball to her underhand or you were doing tap, tap, feeding. Yeah. But yeah. You know, she hit the ball really well. Yeah. Not, you know, the whole thing, teaching information transfer. And, um, you know, to this day, that's still a, a major problem in the industry. Welby Van Horn, probably the best, one of the best for sure, combination of a player and a teacher. Mm -hmm. A teacher who, somebody who actually takes someone from the beginning level all the way to being a, a world class tennis player. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Welby said it so well. It's a bonus if you can play. It's a bonus. You know, mm -hmm. Vic mm -hmm. also said, mm -hmm. if, if you expect your students to play, you should expect yourself to be able to play. Um, I guess yeah. I do think yep. you, you know you have to come to the crossroads where you you're going to be wrapped up in your students' game or you're going to be wrapped up in your own game. With uh, yeah, yeah. I, at one time, I did so much work to have the program become selective because the dental hygiene program, that was our role model. It was a two-year program. People trained to be a dental hygienist. And, you know, they had uniforms. It was just so professional. And, you know, you'd go there and you'd have your teeth cleaned for free. Uh, there was a wait list. But um, yeah. it was just first class, that whole program. And um, Yeah. So I set it up where back with the NTRP, I think it was set up where you had to be a four or five and, and, uh, I had to go through all the different steps with, uh, you know, signatures and committees and it was not easy to get that approved. I got it approved and then I said, no, we're not, not interested. I changed my mind. Uh, but I was told when I started that program for every 20 students, I would have another full-time faculty member and that never happened. I was the only full-time faculty wow. member outside of the team coach. Uh, the team coach would teach yeah. one class. And there were some team coaches, there was three that, um, like say Robert Cox was there and he had a background in, in country club tennis and we had him teach uh, programming. We didn't have him teach team coaching. You know, that was a, that was a, be <laughs> that was a, that was a beauty of being in charge where he say, Cox, I know your background and you're, you're gonna teach programming. And, you know, he did, you know, everybody, everybody set out a calendar of events and, you know, it was very, 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 very good. Um, with, uh, but 
Talk to us about the USTA. They have the USTA U program. What's going on with that? I mean, you're a USTA employee. I know there's way too much bashing yeah. of the USTA. That's uh, something that uh, there's so many great people and so many great causes. I think we get into the player development yeah. program. I think that's where the bashing takes place is everybody is just throwing mm -hmm. dart, dart, darts at player development. But what about USTA U? What do you know about that? Um, not, not much into my, in my realm of, of, uh, my sphere of, of influence or, or anything like that. But USTAU is, is definitely something that, uh, is a newer part to the USTA and multiple components. I believe Scott Schultz was the one that kind of was leading it at first and is no longer, uh, with the USTA. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on in terms of, uh, uh, where it's going and all, but but definitely working on trying to align the two teaching bodies and accrediting the teaching bodies, the PTR and the USPTA, and making sure that you know if if you if you think about what it takes to become a tennis professional these days, um, you know it it takes so much longer for somebody to be able to be a nail technician, a fingernail technician in New York City than it does for you to be a certified teaching professional in the United States. And um, I, I, I don't know what other federations are doing like you do probably see, but I know that it's a lot different than what we're doing at the USTA. So I think the USTA U is just trying to um, do more to ensure that there are higher standards of education for certifying our tennis teaching professionals. Um, and uh, I think that part of it is, as you mentioned, there's blame game and there's a lot of finger pointing and, and it always seems to go to the USTA. And so I think there was some uh, people in the leadership world there that said, okay, well, if, if we're going to be the ones that are shouldering all of the blame and answering all of the questions for why we don't have what number of players in the top 100, then we're going to really try to help our certifying body be better at what they do and help them and support them in, the, in what they're trying to accomplish. So I think in terms of USTAU, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, those listening that are USTA employees, but I think that was pretty much the impetus of why they went there and, and what they were trying to do. Well, some of you, you know, Really well, Kevin O'Shea. What a great Irish name! With, yes, I love that guy. I mean, he's been at A and M now, but for a long time. But um, he works with Steve Denton. But he worked with you for a long time at the Texas Tennis yep, Association. Yeah, So I was at A and M, and there's many different capacities of being at A and M, uh, like maybe being a fan, watching a tennis match, but um, having so many former students who've played at A and M. But back in the day, Laura Hanna from Tyler, Texas, I mean, she became a very good player, worked with her, and she played at A&M, and through her it was set up um, because the, they had an interim head coach during her four years, and this woman was from the phys ed department. So next thing I know is I'm uh, teaching the phys ed teachers, taking you know a, a group of uh, two vanfuls, of students to A&M to teach tennis teachers for a weekend. Actually, a side note, we've talked about where we took Vic Braden, but why I mentioned, we took Vic Braden in Texas A&M, why I mentioned Kevin O'Shea. So Steve Denton was interested in having a learning center at Texas A&M mm -hmm. and they're trying to raise money. They still haven't, to this day, they haven't uh, built indoor courts. But the idea was if they built indoor courts, he wanted to have a learning center where they would train coaches. So I'm mm -hmm. on campus, two different times. And so we have to go meet with, uh, uh, somebody who's on the academic staff. I'm sure it was a D I'm not sure what the title was, but so I was telling Kevin O'Shea at that time, he's a college coach. I said, Kevin, he's telling me how many rules are college rules in the NCAs, which is certainly true. But I said, I think, mm -hmm. I think it's more complicated in academia. So sure enough, we go in to meet with this person and the person was someone that I knew from 20 years ago. 20 years gone by, who was part of those uh, clinics where we were training PE teachers. And I, actually, um, the person had written a booklet on our weekend 
and he had it, he had it on his shelf. The, the, um, he goes, well, I, let me pull this off my shelf. I go, I got to have that in my library too. Is that he actually wrote a, a narrative on uh, what we did for the PE department at Texas A&M. But, you know, but, but he explained to us, and get back, back to the USTAU, um, it's not simple for the USTAU to go into a college setting. Are they going to go through hospitality? Yeah. Are they going to go through phys ed? What department are they going to be in? And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, just to get one uh, class changed, I remember at Tyler Junior College, I used to have to go through seven committees and get 14 signatures to make one curriculum change. <laughs> and it was like, whoa. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I've definitely slowed down. I don't know if I could could do at 26 today what, what I did back then. But um, no, I do think that that's uh, an obstacle. Um, Chad Berry, who we had on, through Scott Schultz, they're both fair staters. Scott, yeah. uh, Chad has spent five years with us and, and I, I had talked to Scott about the, they had a program going to be, at, it was going to be at central Florida and, and, uh, but you know, Chad's a bright guy and it's like, well, you know, it, there's, it's it'd be very, it's very difficult for them to have, uh, not that, you know, cookie cutter is the right term because I think people take a lot of shots at that where it's like, okay, we're going to do the same curriculum at each program or each, each mm-hmm. university. You know, sometimes it's a junior college, sometimes it's a bachelor's degree, there's a master's program. Um, but Scott, you know, he was, uh, when he was with the USDA, you know, when he called me up and I said, Scott, you're a briefcase guy and I'm a ball hopper guy. And, <laughs> and, and we, we met up in uh, mm-hmm. Lake, Lake Nona when there was more bulldozers and there were tennis balls. It was just, it's amazing, <laughs> it's amazing to see how beautiful that facility is, but... Um, yeah, someone I don't know very well, but I did talk to him at the US Open one time. Uh, Greg Jones, who's I know a leader. With, yes, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, he's a leader with Little Kid Tennis in uh, the USTA, and he had said that Scott Schultz had, you know, really, uh, you know, tried to step forward and talk about what we have the great base as a curriculum, but the, the word system was used. And I remember Greg just saying that this, you know, the USTA has to stay away from the word system. But actually, not too mm-hmm. long ago, Matt Clore was with the USTA, and he, he now is at the University of Florida, but he was a national coach for, I think, four and a half years. And um, people just don't know. They have, they have, they'd have to spend a, quite a bit of time with us, you know, in person first, I think, and then on, with the online content to really have a handle on what, mm-hmm. what the Great Base is. Um, they, they say, well, if it's a lifelong study. It's, it's Braden information. It's Vandermeer information. And you go on and on and on. But this setting, so Greg Jones uh, says to Matt Clore, um, you know, what do you think of the Great Base? And uh, it was just a perf- perfect time. He said, Matt, Matt said, well, why don't you look down at court two? And it was a, a junior player. She, she's a pro player now, Ashton Kruger, who grew up under Dave Anderson. And, yeah. Uh, and he said, uh, that's your answer right there. Just watch her hit a tennis ball. And, wow. um, there's, yeah, there's just not too much of that going on, but I, I want to ask mm-hmm. you about little kid tennis quick start. Um, yeah, you were the quick start champion, uh, Tom Fye, who passed away this past <laughs> year. He, he was, he was a champion the second year, but I'm at the U S open and somebody says, Hey Smith, uh, you should have seen this demonstration over on court, such and such. It was teaching, teaching little kids. And, uh, the guy who ran it was awesome. I go, yeah, what was his name? And then you go, Mike Carter. And I looked down and go, I've never heard, never heard of him. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> tell us about Quick Start. Why did that name go away? That's a that's a really good question. Um, I I don't I don't know. I don't know why it went away. I I can only imagine that somebody got on a treadmill and saw the Quick Start button on that treadmill, and that's how it came. But uh, I don't know. It went from 36, 60, the quick start to uh, uh, 10 and under tennis, I guess, is, and, and now net generation. So, but yeah, that, that, that really was a huge part of, of what I was doing um, and still do with USTA Texas for sure is talk about roguey, red, orange, green, and yellow balls on the 36 and 60 and 78 foot courts and, and, uh, 
you know, getting getting more people playing. And specifically, that that was kind of such a youth thing, and I think that might have been a bit of a misstep on us. You know, we didn't want, um, you know, we didn't want kids to see parents and grandparents playing with a red ball or an orange ball, and so we really said this is youth only. Um, and now we realize that you know, you just you got to pick the right tool out of your toolbox to help people. Uh, that are right there in front of you. Whatever they need, you know, you fix it with the tool that that is most appropriate. And and I think that's kind of what the whole quick start slash net generation, the ten and under tennis is is all about is is uh, using the right court, the right the right ball um, to help uh, individuals move ahead in their game. You know, so yeah, that's that's my world. With quick start, I was told that there was uh, perhaps a lawsuit from the company QuickBooks and it was going to go back and forth in the, forth in the courts. But I don't, I was asking you for verification. I don't, I have no idea why it was dropped. Never but, heard that. But I wrote an article, um, you know, it's not the quick start, it's the right start. And then Rich, Rich, yeah. Richard yeah. Hernandez at that time, he's the one who said tennis needs a great base initiative. And, yeah. you know, now we have a little bit of a problem with people saying, are you a great baser? Like it's a cult. And, you know, oh, we, brother. We, we tease and say we should start calling ourselves solid fundamentals. Would it would have been a better name? I yeah. Think. Actually, Dave Secker <laughs> said uh, safe tennis. Uh, that was a very good comment. Uh, you know, prevention of injury, how you're teaching young people to play um, mm-hmm. with. Don't really hear much more much about the thirty six foot court anymore. I know it was a great model for indoor courts where you could have so many people playing side to side, playing east and west versus north and south. What about the thirty six foot court? Is that still a push or is that something that's obsolete with the USTA? I think it's I think it's still a push. Um, and uh, more in the eight and under. I mean, people are are rushing to get out of that and getting into a seventy eight foot you know, yellow ball, um, situation, maybe green dot. Um, and, but with our play tracker program, it's, it's definitely still a thing where kids need to earn a certain number of, of, uh, of participation points at the red level. If you're eight and under, um, and then you can move into the orange ball, orange and the 60 foot court, but yeah, it's still a push and still a thing with our play tracker. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so, still a valid part of, of USTA tennis for our listeners. Um, you know, I think people should hit with a phone ball, you know, if say, in a, if you have the, yeah. the uh, opportunity to have an indoor, like say in a garage, you put up a, yeah. you put up a piece of plywood and you hit with a phone ball. I mean, you just, you've got to get in reps uh, out of general principles. I'll have uh, advanced players hit with orange balls. You just roll them out and say, yeah. you guys, just go rally from service line to service line. Slow down and get the racket in below the ball. And um, the, uh, But, yeah, I think that so many people um, are opposed to that and don't look at mm-hmm. the three different color balls as training, mm-hmm. as training tools. And I want to make sure that the listeners, too, know that I'm not that guy, and I don't think many of the UST people are trying to be this dictatorial um, group of individuals that say you got to do red, you got to do orange. When it's when you're on court and and when you're a pro, I mean that's what our play tracker says. You know, get a certain number of participation points in red. Now move to orange, but it doesn't say that there's a door in between. And once you go through that door, you can't go back or you can't experiment and go up. We're not saying on your practice court, don't ever touch an orange ball. And pro, if you're going to throw an orange ball at an eight-year-old or a seven-year-old, you are ridiculous. That's not part of it either. We understand that there are benefits and values for a smaller individual, a smaller kiddo um, or an adult to, to play with a yellow ball and give that a try. You know, but really, if if you start seeing kids start to maneuver their grips around and their swing patterns, the shape of their swings around because the ball is flying over their head, then um, that's when you go back. You know, so don't let don't make it this forbidden fruit this that you can never go and hit with a green dot ball. Um, and like you just said, if an individual is a yellow ball 
quote unquote player, there is always room to go back to that red ball and that foam ball. There's always value in that, you know, to go back and slow it down. At one time, you remember there was a rally ball it was seven percent bigger, and the only yeah. the only negative of the rally ball is it wouldn't go through a ball machine, mm-hmm. and, it, and it didn't make it. I tie this in with pickleball. I really think the seniors, the rackets are so advanced now. It's not the ball is coming faster, and, and it's more difficult for senior players to play on a regulated regulation yeah. fast court with a regulation ball. But it would have been interesting if seniors would have played with the green dot ball on a sixty foot court. Yeah. And if yeah. And if that if that had taken place, um, you know, I think the growth of pickleball is great. It's activity, it's health, but they're invading tennis. Uh, I heard someone say the other day, he goes, "That's just now, but pickleball is going to be so big is that there's going to be pickle." And I know that's true. Is there's pickleball facilities being built? Um, yeah. Yeah. That, I think that would have been something that, uh, you know, with the, 30, mm-hmm. with, with the 36 foot court, um, you know, it, it just seems like it, it, there could have been the meetings of the minds to try to uh, adapt. Yeah. Uh, the term bridge sport. Um, I wonder if someone were to show up to play pickleball and they were to use a, um, a spec racket, which is really a spin off of the uh, paddle tennis that. Yeah, uh, Althea Gibson, Bobby Riggs, um, Pancho Gonzalez started with. If you showed up to play pickleball and you had a different racket, if they would, if people would complain, I guess because it's becoming more competitive, they would. But what are your thoughts yeah. on, pick, on pickleball? Yeah. Love pickleball. I love what it's doing. I feel like it's it's such a good benefit for our pros. I mean, my my goal is to try to really help tennis teachers be as you know, uh, happy and rich as possible, you know, try to drive more people to those courts. And, 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 and so I think pickleball is just another revenue stream. I I don't know that if, you know, if you're, if you're not in it, if you're not doing it, you're, you're probably getting left behind. I I, I think, you know, if, if you've got those, um, courts over there that are, that are unused, I was just talking to a gentleman yesterday about, how they had a backboard kind of court and everything. It was just dilapidated. So they slapped uh, four pickleball courts on there. Wonderful idea. That's a great idea. And, and I just don't know that, um, I don't know everybody, if everybody's on that train, I have no fear that that pickleball is going to take over tennis. If you look at tennis's over the last two years, the new players that have come to tennis, just take that piece of the tennis pie, the new players, is still far more than pickleball has in in total, you know. So there's no there's no worry about. Yeah, I think we probably should have looked at it a long time ago to where we could have unified. I love what PTR is doing, where they have what the PSR. You'll know this better than I do, I think, Steve. But you know where they're really taking it and 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 doing something in terms of certif- certifying you know, pickleball players and Padel, you know? And so that's, that's the other thing that's coming. So many of our facilities here in Texas are looking at, if not already creating a Padel center there too. So um, anyway, huge fan of pickleball. I've not played it that much. I still don't understand the scoring very well, but, um, but uh, huge fans right now. I think that, uh, tennis kids, you know, you can't beat them, join them. And if, if someone's taught really well, I mean, they've taught to go forward and they have very good volleying skills, short, compact swings, uh, a tennis player is going to prevail. Um, Absolutely. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's more activity. And I know uh, it's just interesting. Um, you, you go to a public park and, you know, people, people are playing pickleball from the service line in. Uh, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. The, um, yeah and that's the other thing too about pickleball steve is i think you know they've got the momentum now and that my that's my only caveat to where i get a little irked is they need to kind of form their nonprofit associations their local associations like we have like tennis has and advocate to the city that they're in 
to get some standalone pickleball courts. They, they can be on the same facility as a tennis uh, court. That, that's fine. That makes some sense. But to start taping up and painting up the, the, the tennis courts is where I kind of am drawing the line a little bit now that they've got this, um, this momentum. Um, and, uh, you know, if, 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 like I said, if there is a facility that has an unused court that's completely dilapidated, yeah, let's refurbish that and put that, make that their pickleball center. But the taping lines and the painting lines on the traditional tennis courts, when they've got this, uh, this momentum right now they, they need to, to organize and advocate locally to the government officials to, to get their own uh, facilities with pickleball um, with pickleball the um, you know you hear all the time that it fits society today because it's instant gratification it's just a quick, yeah. a quick fix you can play right away and I do think that's you know, something that's a, it, it just, it's just, it's just a fact about tennis is that the learning curve is different. You know, it takes a long time to, to become a competent tennis player. Mm -hmm. But so, you know, I, I think that, you know, a Dennis Vandermeer would say, okay, we're going to teach you to play tennis, but we're going to play pickleball first and then come back to tennis. You know, okay, here are the strokes, go play pickleball, but come back because we want you to play both pickleball and tennis and combine the sports. In other words, that you play mm -hmm. both, you play both, but the progression I think would be to, you know, in, in a, but I, I watch people teach pickleball and they're not teaching it like tennis. So, That's what I was just about to ask Steve. I have no idea where, where the pickleball instruction is going in terms of grips and shapes of swings and what makes sense. But you're saying they, that, that it's there, there, it could be similar, but it's not. Well, there's a public park in Boynton Beach, Florida that has, you know, it's, it's kind of a tongue twister, three wall racquetball. You know, mm. it, it, you have to be my age to play. I mean, these old men come out and they, the, the swearing that goes on, the competitiveness is kind of fun to watch. It's uh, <laughs> definitely PG-13, if not worse. Uh, and those, those, those walls are used for lacrosse. They're used for, I saw someone you know, practicing volleyball skills today. Um, mm. They're used for everything. It does, there is a sign that says, you know, racquetballers have the have first priority. Um, but backboards aren't really being built. And it's the best way to hit the most amount of balls. But with that, um, I watch people teach pickleball. And they're not teaching it like tennis. Yeah. yeah. But I think that that's, I don't know what the, I have no idea what the PTR and USPTA are doing. I know they're new to pickleball. Everybody is in that sense. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I just, I think that uh, people would be clever to say, we're going to learn tennis skills to play pickleball because there's, yeah, there's a, yeah. there's a built-in bonus. And I think I just, you know, the people that are making money at it right now are tennis players and, you know, someone out of the blue, my son, Connor, um, you know, good doubles player, good hands, la di da di da Someone called me up and said, you know, your son should be playing pickleball. He'd make, you know, X amount of money, X amount of dollars per year. Um, um, yeah, so we'll have to see how that, that, that turns out, but it's de definitely, uh, they're, they're developing this pro league and Tom Brady's bought a yeah. franchise and Kim Gleister's. And Gosh, it's crazy. Tell us about some of the causes. With so the, Steve, you're saying they did. Sorry. Go ahead. Did they, they did contact Connor about playing on one of the pro teams? No, just someone who, uh, no, they, not, not a pro team, but just, you know, a, a tennis nut said, Hey. This, this, oh, okay. this, this is where there's some easy money to be made. Um, mm. I know Ryler DeHart, who we trained from the time, you know, he's a very young guy. Actually, Thomas Olshted was his first coach who went to the tennis tech program. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, for years, I mean, he was taught by uh, Thomas Olshted and he was taught by me. I made a video for him when he's, um, uh, before he won the Florida State 12s. And anyway, uh, then he went to play with for Tylee. So he had three, three of us from tennis tech. Uh, he played for Tylee, wow. Tylee wow. Illinois, but he plays pickleball and, um, you know, I'd have to ask him about it, but, um, yeah, I think that would be the, the secret to keep, you know, tennis, you know, tennis number one is like, let, let's, let's combine pickleball as a learning step 
uh, progression to tennis. Um, 100% agree. And, you know, that way people are learning two sports. But they shouldn't be. Yeah. I, I don't think people should be taught two sets of skills. You know, this is how you play pickleball. Mm -hmm. this is how you, you know, granted, mm -hmm. granted, there's going to be some different strategy with the kitchen and not being able to close in. But um, Yeah. But I wanted to touch upon that you made go into detail 30 years with the USTA. You've done so many different things from mm -hmm. underprivileged, underprivileged children to, um, you know, working wheelchair players. Um, why don't you just talk about some yeah. of the things that you've done with USTA? Yeah. Done a lot of that stuff. Well, you know, just since the very beginning, we've always been the tournament directors for the special Olympics uh, group and, and have always, we're one of the only, if not the only, uh, um, governing body of tennis that actually runs the tournament in Texas, anyway, the uh, Texas version of, of the Special Olympics Games. And so we've been doing that. We've got a great uh, adaptive and wheelchair ambassador. Cindy Benson is uh, a, a good friend and a cohort of mine here at USTA Texas that, that runs that. She was a great player, by the way, too, number one in, in the world in, in the women's 30s at one point. So but she, uh, she's wonderful in what she does with that. And we do a lot of that type of stuff. We, we engage with a lot of different families. Just got a call from the, the Rainbow Group. Um, I, uh, they are um, families of same-sex parents. And so they're looking for athletic um, outlets, you know, what to do with their children. And so it's been really, really neat to see the diversity in all of that and being able to be able to have tennis as a common kind of activity and language and see what it can do for families and those that are underprivileged. We've, we've just taken over what used to be called a TAP tournament. It was an international tournament for uh, stand-up players, so non-wheelchair players, um, but individuals that have a physical disability, most of them are missing some type of a limb. It would be like a Roger Crawford type of a situation. Many of them have a prosthetic leg or arm. Um, and so Texas is going to, uh, in 2023, now have that tournament and produce that tournament. And we'll have an international competition uh, for, for stand-up dis disabled uh, players here in uh, Houston. And we'll probably get... 30 to 35 of them from all across the world. It, it, it's a wonderful tournament and it's going to be really cool this weekend in Austin, Texas. We'll, we'll have another all comers camp, you know, where it's an, a national wheelchair camp and uh, we'll have probably uh, 30 to 40 different wheelchair players. Some of the um, former world ranked players being coaches. And then we'll have a lot of youth. Our, our wheelchair program is bursting at the seams right now. Lots of new players. So, that's that's really really cool too so um that's always been part of my role um even since the very first day at usta texas and back then it was called texas tennis association i've been there so long um but yeah just have always been able to uh do various events not only just schools um you know events and assembly programs for all of the kiddos and by the way when you do that there's always that kiddo that is maybe has some down syndrome or they they're in a wheelchair and and so you try to include them and integrate them into what you do but i've always been super lucky at being able to have that as part of my role and 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 doing that all across the state it's been a lot of fun with um the schools program is that still in place where people go to assemblies the uc still do that it is yeah we don't do as many assemblies as we used to. And I think that's a, a big problem. We got to get that back. Cause not only is that a lot of fun for everybody, but it's a great way to kind of um, introduce those kiddos to a local pro, a local instructor, um, some guys and girls from clubs or the local tennis association. So they get to see, Oh, there are some really friendly people. Yeah. I really had a good time here. I want to sign up for their classes. So we really need to do a better job of doing that. But yeah, Steve, so we've got like, just in Texas alone, over 900 PE teachers um, introducing tennis in the PE, in the gyms, you know, in school tennis. And, uh, and now our job, is, and all of those teachers, once they go through 
our net generation process and they become net generation, um, they've got their profile set up, they all get a free bag of equipment. I mean, so there's 30 tennis rackets of various sizes, 30 foam tennis balls, um, and then other things inside that giant wheel bag, that, that roller bag that, that helps them conduct their their uh, gymnasium or their blacktop tennis uh, program. So, yeah, that's where, where I started off doing that, you know, just uh, doing the in-services for all of those teachers and then doing in uh, the assembly programs just to kind of rally all the kids up. So it was – and it's something that I still do um, on occasion. Well, I can remember with, there was a speaker's bureau. I can remember uh, – um, People that you helped me train, they were students after you had graduated, uh, Craig Tiley and David Anderson. Mm-hmm. They were they were going to schools and doing assembly programs, but I remember they had exams and I remember I went to cover for them. But I also, at one time, the 17 directors, there were you and there was two others, and I remember going to Dallas for a weekend and they had just brought in Rodney Harmon. They put him in charge of that program. Oh, yeah, yeah. But so when you say in-service, you were teaching PE teachers, correct? That's correct. Yeah. That's just their terminology for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, One of their professional development days that they have usually in August, like late August or early September. And then sometimes in January too. And, and, uh, if it's a big school system, I mean, you've got 120 PE teachers, especially if they add in their, their high schools and middle school, if it's K through 12, and so you're in a gymnasium um, with, here we go, Dennis, thank you so much. Is What do you do with 120 people in a gym with a dangerous aluminum weapon? You know, how do you make that uh, work and, and keep everybody safe and, and active and productive? So, um, yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a, a wild ride for sure. I'll tell you an amazing story about a PE teacher. Guy calls me up, he wants to spend spring break with me and just shadow, watch what I do. He wants to learn to teach tennis. And he, at that time, he had taught tennis as a PE teacher for 37 years. So I, I just wow. find this out. He, he comes in and, and uh, he's going to work one more year and then he's retiring. And he said, I've never been able to get people to hit the ball well. You know, I've taught all these different courses or all these different sports activities. But that was just amazing, the dedication. That he goes, I don't want to retire and not, you know, um, I, need to yeah. learn, I need to learn more about tennis teaching. Um, I do find that... Lifelong uh, learner. Yeah, I do find that a lot of times that, um, you know, you've, I've done so many workshops for tennis teachers. Is um, A lot of times it's just the newbies, you know, the people that are just wanting to get into coaching. It's the, the coaches that are, have mm-hmm. the high-profile positions and what have you. They don't go to the conferences or the workshops. Um, that's, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's, un, that's mm-hmm. unfortunate. Yeah. With uh, funding and underprivileged children, uh, what does uh, Texas tennis do for, uh, in that area? I mean, it's tennis has become too expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt. And yeah, we do have, a. am I'm, I'm forgetting the name i should look it up on the website while i'm here i got a computer in front of me but um it's a uh it's a grant and it it those individuals that are awarded that grant small grant it's a very small grant wish we could do more and we're trying to do more with that um and uh and by the way some of those grant monies go to an organization so we have a grant usc texas has a grant for uh diverse families that are in need of, uh, that are financially challenged, that need some money, that money can be used for strings and lessons and travel and hotels and meals and tournament entry fees and, and whatever they want to use it along, as long as it's not, oh gosh, I'm trying to think about what, what an ineligible expense would be, but I can't think of it now. But yeah, just about anything, as long as it's tennis related um that those are eligible expenses they send us receipts and then we send them the money um we also have a huge grant that that it's it's hundreds of thousands of dollars that go out to our local tennis associations like the capital area tennis association which is in austin and dallas and everywhere and so they get funding from us and many times 
that funding helps their scholarship program. That is similar to what we do is where you try to get that money into the hands of the families that absolutely need it. So, um, so there's lots of funding opportunities um, from USTA and USTA Texas and in terms of just helping diverse and, and needy families, uh, those that are, that are maybe underrepresented um, get, get into the game and hopefully stay in the game. I think for tennis teachers making their living from tennis, um, you know, talk about we'll get, we'll get around to player development, the, the bashing of the USTA player development program. It's like the most talked about program in the U S and mm -hmm. there's just so many other facets of facets of tennis. I always told people that you should always be giving a free clinic if it's just once a week. I mean, I, I, yeah. feel, I feel like we still are doing that, you know, you know, even through this podcast, um, is trying to give out, uh, information to help people out. But I think the toughest thing is to help a kid get to tournaments. I mean, it's, it's not that difficult to give a free clinic where you work, but to get kids to tournaments and the, you know, the transportation, the accommodations, and mm -hmm. all that. that's, mm -hmm. um, that, that's another whole challenge. Uh, does the USTA, and I'll say, go ahead. Um, when you, when you start talking about the travel and everything, it makes me think of our safe play program as well. And, and so just another commercial message, so to speak is, is, uh, you know, all those club owners and tennis directors should really make sure that their staff is safe play approved. Many, many are because you can't run like adult leagues or, or be a tournament director, a USDA sanctioned tournament director or a junior team tennis coordinator if you're not safe play approved. But that safe play approval is just a three-step process where you agree to terms, you go through a background screening, background check, and then you complete a safe sport course. That's generally about 90 minutes of, of videos and tests. It's, it's very easy, but it helps individuals recognize abuse. Um, and so um, I, I'm sorry to take a left turn there and everything, but when you talk about pros trying to take kids to, to tournaments, there's a lot of information on how to do that safely um, for their safety and for the safety of the kiddos as well. But um, definitely commercial message for the safe play program. And you can find more at usda.com forward slash safe play. Carter, 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 good commercial, good man. I think with uh, the term billeting, you know, I grew up playing ice hockey and you know, I remember going to Montreal when I was a kid and, you know, staying in a household where not one word of English was spoken. You would actually stay with, you know, you would go and stay with yeah. one of the, the family. The parents would ho host you, one of the um, team players on the other side. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that, for the most part, this just doesn't happen anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I tell people the safest way to uh, chaperone players is teach tennis where they sleep at an indoor club. You know, girls go to the left. Yeah. Boys go to the right. They have a sleeping bag. They have an air mattress. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. You have to talk about what can go behind it with the closed door. But, right. Uh, yeah. The, um, yeah, I just, I think even, uh, a tennis family to adopt a player to help take a player to a tournament, but it's the logistics become overwhelming because the different levels of play and how to get from point mm -hmm. A to point B. And you did mention mm -hmm. strings, uh, go to digress in our conversation, go backwards. Um, mm -hmm. one of your first challenges was teaching people how to string. Correct. <laughs> That was not easy. You've got such a much better memory than me. I forgot about that. No, we had six tabletop stringers. I think they each would cost $200. Yeah. $200. I remember uh, <laughs> a great, great man for tennis, Bill Jacobson, who founded CompuTennis. And the, the, yeah. the price never went down because people didn't buy it. They should have bought it. But it wasn't like the pack, pocket calculator. It was $3,500. And I, I finally bought one out of my own pocket. But I remember telling Bill, I said, well, it's... You know, I just have a seven thousand dollar budget, and he goes, "Well, that's pretty good." <laughs> he thought I meant seven thousand dollars per month. It was uh, oh, it was seven thousand dollars per year. Anybody who trained with us back in the eighties 
we were working, we were using tennis balls that didn't bounce. I mean, I would go to yeah. you know, my adopted hometown, Boca Raton, <laughs> Florida, with a pickup truck, and I would come back. I would go to all these people I knew, like a Jimmy O'Brien at Boca West, and all these different places. I knew all the pros, and I, I remember driving back to Tyler with my pickup truck, just loaded with tennis balls. And had a tarp over mm-hmm. it. I can remember it was freezing, and freezing in Mississippi. And I'm at a gas station, and this guy says, "All those lemons are going to be frozen." And now uh, <laughs> we 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 use the worst tennis balls in the world uh, at Tennis Tech. The worst. With, uh, but so many so many years with the USTA. Um, how long was Ken McAllister there? You worked under him for how many years? Um, let me think. So it must have been 22 years I worked under Ken. Wow. And he was there, um, a couple of years before me. So his tenure was, he was, he was probably executive director for 24, 25 years. Um, wonderful man to work with, by the way. Wonderful man. Um, the USPTA, I mean, he was huge with the USPTA. I mean, he was a tester. Huge. And, yeah. You know, you really have to thank people that get, you know, I hate to use the word politically, they get, they get involved with the game and they work with the associations. Um, mm-hmm. I used to I used to tell people to this day, I mean, if you want to have a voice, I mean, become a member of both the PTR and the USPTA. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been a member forever. Um, Dennis Vandermeer, something that I did not do. Dennis told me, you know, you need to be politically connected. And I remember uh, Dennis asking me to be a board member of the PTR. And I said, thanks, mm-hmm. but no thanks. Because uh, then later at one point I was asked to be a board member of the USPTA. I'm not really in that connected, that involved with either one, but I think you really t- to be a member, you really need to be proactive. But with Ken, yeah. uh, we, we set records at Tyler junior college for the most USPTA um, applicants or the, or the testees, the, the people joining the USPTA, we were, in, you know, 50, 60 people taking the test. Wow. You know, there was big numbers in Japan too, at that time. And you, you, yeah. would, you would have been there where, you know, the pros come in and, um, yeah. and you, and it would have been a Jennifer or a whoever, the student assistants. I mean, I just think of, uh, you know, Steve Young was there for five years. Tylee was there for seven, yeah. seven and Anderson for eight. Um, with, you know, we would come into the room and I would just put on my game face and make sure everybody else had their game face. I said, no one's going to snicker. No one's going to smile. No one's going to question anything. We're just going to take notes. We're going yeah. to ask these four, yeah. 14, 15 testers what we could do better. And they all knew so much about tennis and there's so much... There's so much more to giving a good lesson than just being a technician. There's a lot of technicians that can't, yeah. can't really give a good lesson. And, yeah. but, um, it really comes back to the Braden, the Braden study. If, you know, if someone really knows Vic Braden backwards and forwards, you go into a, a, a meeting like that in a certain way, yeah. the, the students knew more than the testers. Oh, for sure. And, um, you know, people just with this, you know, they, they sound, that sounds like an egotistical statement, but, um, you know, the, our students, our young students would have a very difficult time where one, one of the USPTA pros is, would demonstrate, they go, this is my uh, efficient backhand and this is my inefficient backhand. You know, they might change their grip <laughs> or open way up on a one-hander. Uh-huh. And our, our young students would, you know, would be puzzled because they had so many problems with their normal demo. <laughs> it, it was, um, the, um, but people had to really, you know, that's where Dennis Vandermeer years later said to me, Steve, you're right. Um, it's not certification, it's education. There was a, mm-hmm. um, a tornado that touched down at the tennis club of the South in Atlanta. And we both were in Atlanta teaching in such a huge city and there was no, the weather was so bad. So everybody shows up at the tennis club of the South to help out. So Dennis and I were there picking up branches and whatever you have you years later after tennis tech. And that's one thing he said to me is that it's, it's not certification, it's education. It has to be on, yeah. it has to be ongoing. Um, yeah, that's where, you know, I think back about tennis tech where so much was thrown at, uh, you know, people were 
you know, with, you know, Burwash and Lair and Grapple and just was so much, it was, um, so much information was laid out for the people that were studying there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With, um, I, I want to get into your, uh, extracurricular activity, this, uh, fitness, um, being a national champion in Carter, we got to get into that, but let's, I saw you in New York oh one time, gosh. I saw you in New York one time at the open and, uh, I couldn't go. I said, I want to go, but I can't go. I have to go out to the open and watch such and such. But you were giving a lecture on the P's. Let's go through your P's. Okay. I've got the copy in front of me here. I've got a few of my own. Yeah. i got a few of my own P's. But it is a very powerful uh, uh, number of words in the English language that begin with P. But give us the, give us the P's. I Tyler. know. And, and uh, it's crazy. It's, so I'll go through it and you just stop me when you want to stop me and we can yeah, talk yeah. about it. But, um, you know, it's just. It, I when I looked at this and you'd mentioned this, I was like, oh my gosh, this thing is twenty some years old. This presentation is just a a long time. So it's it's um, my my four P's for personal proficiency and perhaps perfection. It used to be personal perfection, and I thought, you know, that's not you know nobody's going to be perfect. So it's personal proficiency and perhaps perfection. Um, but I, I categorize the P's into four different categories. Uh, the me P's, the key P's, the we P's, and the flea P's. The me P's are kind of, you know, all about yourself. You know, finding your own hole, another P word. And kind of like when you were on the airplane, put your own mask on first before you help the others, right? So those are the me P's. The key P's are kind of the pillars upon which you build. And then the we P's are your team, your personnel, your players, your partners, and your participants. And then the flea P's are the ones that you want to just completely run away from. And I, I call that purging the pollutants. And so those are the four categories. Thought. It's good. Oh, man. It's good. It's good. Good. Keep going. The P's, uh... <laughs> Proper preparation right. prevents piss poor performance. <laughs> right. Well, this one, so we'll start with the me piece, finding your pulse. And uh, it, my first bullet here is the positive personal policy is priceless. Positive personal policy is priceless. And my first sub bullet under there is press it. And this might be a little outdated, but pressing, I'm just talking about Gosh darn it, if you've got an iron, frickin' iron your clothes, baby. I think, you know, Burwash mentioned that we talked about this before. It's like, if if you look at in an airport and you see the worst dressed person, it's probably a tennis player. We gotta, you know, you, you gotta, you act a lot better and different when you look good. So look the part. Get that iron out. Don't have coffee stains on your warm up. <laughs> You know, don't have nasty, crappy tennis shoes. I mean, look the part. I know a lot of times this stuff is expensive and everything, but look, it's not expensive to wash your hair, shave your face, and press your shirt. That's an easy way to do it. And here's a quick little um, quote um, from the theater world. And so I'm going to take a little bit of an aside, but a dramatic setting will encourage an inspired performance. And the reason I put that on there, that's not just your personal way, the way you look personally, but how does your tennis facility look? A dramatic setting is one that where the trash cans aren't overflowing. If you have a garden, there aren't weeds and grass pulling out. If you have grass, it's mowed. If you're, if you have windscreens, they're zip tied up and firm. You know, you just make make the if if it's dark, that's a that's a huge study and something that I helped one of our clubs locally with is, you know, I was dropping my kid off to this to the to the program. This was many years ago when she was playing and the place was just dark and creepy and, and she had no she was a great instructor, but nobody ever stayed in the program. I said baby let's get some lights out here you know get your your uh your your crew out here and light this place up this is crazy dark and scary she did it and 
certainly tur- and we did it a couple other things and turned her program around and she was very grateful. So anyway, that, that setting um, is also a thing where, where you want to try to make sure that, that your place looks good. Your place of business looks good. The toilets have toilet paper and are clean, you know, so people really want to come back and, and, and uh, continue to, to, to um, join your lessons, join your leagues and buy your stuff in the pro shop. Um, the next bullet is posture. And you and I, you know, talking about Lair, we know this, and this kind of comes from the, 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 the cure in the, between the points is if you are slumpy in the shoulders and if, you're, if your pace of walking is slow and if you are, um, and if you're constantly frowning, the posture is, you know, just, just get your chin up, get your chest out, stand taller. We all know that physical actions create a chemical in your, to, to, uh, come into your brain and help you feel better. So that's why people pump their fists. That's why tennis players pump their fists. And they, that's why we tell, um, players in between points to walk quicker, to look at your strings, don't control your eyes, but you're walking quicker, act confident, look confident. And that's all a part of this positive personal policy as well is, is, is just, uh, walking with a purpose and having a better posture. Um, and then the last part of it is pretend. Sometimes we just don't have, um, we don't have a great day. We wake up and we don't feel great. And, you know, at that point, we just need to pretend. And it's all about, one, it's all about looking the part, getting, having your, a better posture, and pretending <laughs> to be enthusiastic. You know, it was, I think, Newcomb that used to, you know, when he would, hit a ball in the net um, or make a mistake out on the court, he, he would force himself to smile and he was pretending to, uh, to smile. And what would happen is when those facial muscles start to go up, those chemicals in the brain start to start flowing and you start to feel better. And I challenge everybody out there listening to give that a try. Next time you want to, uh, hit a ball on the fence or break a racket or you're in traffic. I mean, see what happens when you force yourself to smile. I guarantee your attitude will immediately start to change. Thoughts, questions. No, it's great. Um, fake it till you make it act as if it's a powerful tool. Um, no, I love it. I love it. Keep going, Carter. <laughs> All right, here we go. So the next one on the me piece is picture and it's visualization. Um, so I just wanted to go over, you know, you, you know much more about visualization and you know that um, every great player, you know, before he or she is about to serve, before he or she is about to return, they have a plan. They ha- they visualize what they want to have happen. And um, just to kind of illustrate how important visualization can be, it's a quick um study that was done in 1996 in Chicago and it was a, it, done on free throws and there were three groups and you know where this is going already but the three groups were one group got to practice free throws for a week one group did nothing but sit on a couch and could not practice free throws for a week and I think it was like 30 minutes a day for a week and then the other group just sat in a chair and thought about you know, free throws for 30 minutes every day for a week and guess what happened? You know where the story is going. I mean, the, the group that actually hit the free throws or practiced the free throws, they got better by 24%. The group that did nothing, they did not improve at all. And the group that visualized, they improved by 23%. They improved almost as much as the group that actually did the, the actual free throws that were physically shooting the free throws. So visual visualization is huge. Um, my next one is, is perspire and we can, we can kind of skip over that. We know that we have to have that um, passion to practice and we know that precise practice is huge. And so we, we don't, what we all know that hard work is very, very important no matter what you want to do. And so, so we'll move move on to the next one, which is called persistence. And you know, everybody 
has the ups and downs in life. And every month, every year, every day, there's, there is an up and down. And so my P word here is be pliable. You know, you, you need to be able to bounce back. You need to have a really horrible memory. You know, the best tennis players don't, they, they flush it. And that's my next one is the physical action. We talked about it just a little bit about the physical actions of persistence and to get through the ups and downs is to um, sometimes th- there's a group called the positive coaching Alliance that I work with a little bit and I love them. And, and one of theirs is just flush it. You know, they just have some of their coaches have their athletes just pretend like they're actually flushing a toilet. And that is their physical action to kind of reset the brain and move on to the next point. So it's all about having that, that short memory. So that, that wraps up my P, my uh, me P, Stephen. Well done. Well done, Carter. I love it. Keep going. Keep going. All right. Here we go. Uh, all right. We're going to keep moving. Key P's. These are the pillars, the key P's. So prioritize and have perspective. So I think these are kind of somewhat together. I think when you prioritize what is the most important thing for you, you get a better perspective into what's meaningful in life. So that, that's what the prioritize and perspective. I think everybody needs to do a little bit of reflection and make sure that you're, you prioritize what's important to you. And here's the deal. If you write these things down, if these are your goals, these are your priorities goals or action items for this year or this month. I think you need to go back and reflect on those though. And don't, don't feel like that you're, you're uh, unable to reevaluate that as well. So I think your priorities do shift as you age, as you move forward, as things happen when COVID hits and everything else. I think that, that we, um, always need to have a time of reflection so you can look at these prioritized activities and to help you have better per, uh, perspective. Um, next one is the perennial predictability. This is kind of a funny one for me just because um, I, I'm positively unpredictable in a lot of ways, especially when my kids were young and I was a parent. And, and now, as you know, Steve, I'm about to be a grandparent. I could have gotten a call I, while we were on this uh, on our podcast here. I'll have to check after we're done. Um, but uh, that positive unpredictability is kind of that fun uh, part of it, too. And so perennial positivity, back to the first bullet, though, is that is a really important thing for when you're leading people, when you're in the family, when you're leading players on the court, you need to um, make sure that those kiddos don't have to wonder what mood is my coach going to be in perennial perennially, you are going to be positive. And, uh, and so with the predictability that the consistency is there, you always have to stand for something there. Um, Stand for something, and that's and, and that's just your own personal goals and your personal uh, truth and uh, being perennially positive. Next one's patience, um, and I'm going to skip over that. We'll just go to the last one: is people. So here are your key P's, in my opinion. Um, for for a pillar, you people. You know, we could use people in every single one of these categories, Steve. Um, obviously in, for, in different ways, but here I'm going to just use a quote by Indira Gandhi. One of my um, uh, very favorite quotes is at one time power meant muscle, but now it means getting along with people. And I, I feel like um, that it could be misconstrued. I think my wife at one time when I mentioned that, and I was really trying to, make sure that we got it through our children and I get it through my staff and everything that, that getting along with people does not mean that you're, you're bending over or letting them walk over you. That is not at all what that means. That means that you're able to have a honest and professional conversation with individuals to let people know 
where you stand, but you're doing it in a way that is productive and professional and friendly and courteous. And, and so, um, once again, at one time, power meant muscle, but now it means getting along with people. And I, I think that's more important now than ever. So that wraps up my key piece, sir, the pillars. Moving on to the we piece, if you don't have any other uh, questions or comments. The we piece, our personnel, our partners, our players, our participants, it's really your team. So here's, here's something that's the principles, not pet peeves. I think uh, we talked about, um, we talked about having pri- prioritizing and all of that. Well, everybody has principles. And I think when you're working with teams, you have to have those principles either written down or absolutely discussed. I think in the tennis world, we have parents that come in, as you mentioned, Steve, many parents and kids bop around from coach to coach. But when they come to you, I know that they are told what what to expect here. This is what we expect from you. This is what you should expect from us. And those are the principles that you all have and, and what is vital to have when, when you're working with any part of the team. Um, written down, well-documented. If you're talking to um, individuals that you're going to hire, I think it's very important to discuss that at the interview. Make sure your interviews, those of you listening to this podcast, I know that you're leaders and you interview people regularly. Um, they need to know what they're going to um, expect from you, and you need to know what they're going to expect from, from them. And they need to, you need to know that they understand that you've got principles here, and these are, and they are laid out right here. And um, and 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 I think most individuals, especially the youngsters, they they are such great interviewers these days that they're probably going to ask you that question. So you better be ready to be able to answer it. Um, so on the pet peeves side of this, um, it's, it's, I, I see a lot of people, you know, saying, Hey, right. Let's write a sign and put it on our wall here. Um, clean the coffee, clean your coffee mugs. And here's a sign over here, close this door. And there's another sign over here saying, don't walk here. And I think, um, principles aren't pet peeves. Let's not mistake that. Principles are what your founding principles for your organization are and not just silly um, things that, that you want to make a sign about and, and tape it up on the wall. So, <clears throat> all right, next one. Poor policy um, or maybe perhaps a plethora of policies. Um, I We talked about reflecting and evaluating and then reevaluating. Um, one of the things that when you're working with teams and if you want to lose a good team is have poor policy or a plethora of policies. You don't need to be able to, you don't want to have to police and persecute everybody with all of your policies. So evaluate them and don't be afraid or embarrassed just because you're the leader and you realize that, hey, I had a policy here, and inside you really know that this is not that important, maybe perhaps more of a pet peeve. Well, then here's your P word for that is punt it. Get it out of there. Don't be embarrassed to get rid of that that poor policy. Um, and then the last one on your team for me is play. And I've just, I've, I, I go back to this, um, this company, it, this was several years ago, but um, you got to have fun, you know, with your team, no matter where you are. And I, I, I know we get, it's serious business. Business is serious business, but you got to be able to have a little bit of levity in there. If you want your team to enjoy working with you or your, your team, whether they're players or they're employees. Um, and so this one company, I just loved it. You'd call them up and you'd get their answer machine. And by the way, I can't stand that. If you're at your club, I really hope that you have some way of getting a live human to be answering your phone. I think that's really huge, but I know that's not always an option. And so you get a, you get an answer machine and you go over if, if press one, if you want to 
uh, get our maintenance staff. Press two if you'd like to talk to accounting. Press three if you need to talk to marketing. And press four if you'd like to hear a duck quack. And I know that sounds super silly and you probably wouldn't do it, but this company did and they're very successful. Um, I, I just think that find your option for, you know, find it and, and whatever it might be, it could be a myriad of different things, but I think every successful company and every business and every successful team has an option for, they have that that inside joke, that fun little deal that they do um, that, that really helps them to bond. So that brings us to, that's the end of the we peas, the team. And then our final one, Stephen, is the flea peas. Do you remember what that was? It's purging the pollutants. And this is kind of a quick one. Um, I, I have this flea peas kind of equation, which is pessimism plus pompous plus phony equals poison. And uh, I, I know this is really hard to remember, and I don't expect you guys to. But, by the way, if you would like a copy of this, I'm happy to email it to you. But, uh, or if you, if, you, if you have an opportunity where you need somebody to come talk to your group, I'll, I'll maybe come do that too. Sleepies, pessimism, pompous, and phony is poison, man. So surround yourself only with the best, right? So surround yourself with the best. And yes, you can fire. We already talked about firing or getting rid of punting your policy. But remember, obviously you can fire staff, right? You can fire friends. You know, remember, we're, we're trying to surround ourselves with the only the best. And sometimes our friends aren't those that really have the best interest in mind for us. And so you got to recognize that. And if it's a problem, move on. And then finally, sometimes you got to fire yourself. And so what does that mean? That means maybe use some of the old, you know, get rid of that old self and maybe use some of these um, P words, maybe the, Things that we are looking at for the me peas, positive personal policy is priceless. Maybe you use some of those and start putting those into your life. And so we can go with self number two. So finally, live life from A to Z, but take it one letter of a time, Steve. In other words, that means just live it all, do it all, and just don't try to do it all at once. So, Steve, that's it for the flea peas and the wee peas and the me peas and the me peas. Fantastic. I remember uh, calling Carter up listeners and saying, hey, Carter, I couldn't go to your lecture in New York, so find an hour and you'll have to give, it, give the lecture to me over the phone, which you did with the same level of enthusiasm. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> when's the last time you delivered the, the, this lecture, this format? It was 20 years ago, literally. I, have been, I had to... I had to ask Diane, where is that file with like old talks that I did? <laughs> she led me to it, thankfully. So, yeah. No, that's so well done. It's been a long uh, time. Our listeners, how do they get a hold of you to get, get the email on this? Um, yeah, so my email is, um, is mcarter at texas dot uspa dot com. So M Carter at Texas dot dot com. I'll tell our listeners a story. So at Texas A&M, there was a junior college nationals. And for 15 years, I worked at HCC, a, a tennis complex, Hillsborough Community College. And for 10 of those years, we were in charge of the junior college team. And there was a set of circumstances where the head coach couldn't go. So I, I went to the nationals. And the junior college rules were a little bit more slack than the, you know, say NCAA Division One, And it was, you know, our, the junior college girls, they just practiced with our juniors. So there was a rain delay. Excuse me, there was a rain plan. If mm -hmm. um, they were trying to get the tournament done in six days, but if it rained, you had to be there for seven days. So it didn't rain. So our flight was to leave on a, perhaps a Sunday instead of a Saturday. And 
Uh, so we had a free day. I was with the athletic director who was traveling, and I said, well, let's go to Austin. So you dropped everything. We called up Carter, and these girls are gone. This is going to be such a boring day with Smith. We're going to go to Austin. But if you remember, you were our chaperone. You took us all over Austin for, for like 12 hours. And the, girl, <laughs> and the girls loved it. The girls loved it. Uh, the, uh, so, the, yes, you know, Carter, I do have total recall. I recall totally what I want to. It's um, amazing. I don't know how. Let's go through this. Uh, you know, I perhaps uh, once had called you a chump uh, before, but how did you become a champ? How did you become a national <laughs> champion? Tell us, tell us about your your fitness. Your your. It sounds like your granddaughter or grandson is going to be so so lucky that you're going to live to be 120, Carter. You're a pretty healthy guy. <laughs> when, when did That's this my deal right now, Steve. When did this all take place? When did you start uh, becoming a triathlete? Well, yeah, so it started with mountain biking, and it was like tennis. You know, the reason I this job is just my body was breaking down, and I couldn't I couldn't play without my back killing me or my elbow or whatever. And it, no matter what I was doing in terms of physical therapy, it wouldn't work. And so I was like, oh, God, I got to do something for this competitive thing in me. And, and we went on a vacation, went to a mountain, and they were renting bicycles. So I rented a bicycle, and I went down the mountain, the mountain and then I went straight to my wife and said, I found it. I know what my purpose is in life. And we literally went home and uh, I bought a mountain bike, the, one of the crappiest, cheapest mountain bikes I could ever find. And I started riding the heck out of it. And so um, entered my first race, you know, I just really had that competitive deal. And, and it was, it was um, really eye opening going to your first race, it was age group, you know, and I think I was 35 to answer your question. So it was, it was right about that time and, and just entered into the race and everybody had, you know, the full on kit as they call it, you know, they had the, the Lycra shirt, the Lycra shorts, they had the um, full suspension mountain bikes were um, just coming out. So many of the guys had beautiful stuff and here I was, and I'm not kidding you. I had a t-shirt and cut off blue jeans, not kidding, and tennis shoes with little straps to my pedals. I didn't have the fancy shoes that clipped into the pedals and my bike. And I lined up and we went. And guess what happened? I freaking won the race. And it was one of those life-changing moments thinking that, my goodness, number one, I almost didn't come because I was so nervous. Um, and then I come and then I see all these bikes and all this equipment is similar to what we talked about earlier, Steve, where if a kid had two similar ra or, or, or rackets the same, I was out already. Well, the same thing, but you know, it just goes to show you, you know, you put in the work and you, and you have a little talent and you put in the time and don't let those negative feelings and thoughts happen. Just tow that line. And so, that's that's how that started and then really just right after that steve i found that that they had these off-road triathlons and i'd never done a triathlon in fact i've never swum before at that point i'd never been in a pool other than little kid lessons um way back in ohio and um i i got sick just going there because i just didn't like the water it was kind of crazy so anyway i i signed up for my first triathlon um, I've got six weeks to get ready. I go to the neighborhood pool and I swim, swim air quotes from one end to the other and say, that's it. That's good for day one. And I go home and the next day I literally swim, swam to the other side and swam back and got out and said, okay, that's it for me. I'm done. Here we go. And then I just kept building up and then to where I could swim the distance that I was required, which for that race was just a half mile swim in a lake. And, uh, and then the whole race was a 12 mile mountain bike. So these are all off road triathlons, Steve. And so the, a lake swim or an ocean swim or a river swim, and then a mountain bike and a trail run. So this one was in the lake. Then you do a 12 mile bike and then you do a, a 5k run and same situation. It's in Louisiana I'm staying with my 
brother-in-law. I'm driving out there, and I literally turn around three times. I was so nervous and so psyched out. I could not do it. And, and I just realized, what am I going to say when I show up? And I didn't do it, that you chickened out. So I turned back around, and then I turned back around. Finally, I get there, and it's the same thing. Everybody's got sunglasses that are more expensive than my bike. It's unbelievable. And so we do it. I, I get in there. You just start. You just make a deal with yourself. Okay, Mike, you made it here. Just make a deal. Just get in the water. Just start the first one. If you, The deal is if you don't want to, just swim out and go home. You're fine. So I finish the swim, and I get on the bike. And same, making a deal. You know, just if you don't like it and it gets too rough, just just turn around, go back, get in the car, go home. Fine, finish the bike, get on the run. Hey, make a deal. If you don't like it, go home. You know, so I finished the run and turns out I win the whole race. And it's just, I, I don't say that necessarily to brag, although I love bragging about that, but it, I, I think there's a message in there for everybody. It's like, especially youth, you know, I think we all feel like we're not worthy and we don't have the right stuff or the right equipment or, you know, but it, it's so important to really just focus on you and what you are doing, especially when you go to the next triathlon and you don't win it, you focus on what you maybe didn't do this time. And so I think it's the same with any athlete, you know, you just, you can't measure yourself against other people necessarily. You really should be measuring yourself today versus yourself yesterday. So that, that's, yeah. And me, then just kind of fast forwarding. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, Sorry. Let me ask a couple of questions before you fast forward with yeah. uh, the swimming. Um, I've always been told of the three parts of the triathlon. That's where people struggle the most is swimming. Um, when yeah, you, you it's and I about were the only place that people died. <laughs> Pardon me? It's about the only place that I think people have died. I mean, there may have been, most people die in a, tri if they're going to die in a triathlon, they die in the swim. And it's not necessarily because they're bad swimmers They're It's usually because of a condition that happens, but, but there's a reason to be scared about it. And, and it, yeah, it's difficult. So go ahead. Sorry. Well, one, one note, uh, Jan Gerard, when you and I were in Tyler, Texas, um, I mean, she was yeah. num number one. I can't remember if she was number one at, in the U S or number one in the world. Um, but she was a swimmer at Texas. And then I just remember wow. that that was an advantage that a lot of the tr great triathletes are very good swimmers. Um, someone that you met who I played a lot of doubles with the late Steve Squire from, uh, Huddersfield, yeah. England, he, um, he took up triathlon. So I'm in, in England with him and we go to all these indoor pools as we travel and he's swimming and, and all these little kids are going by him and, and he was a super athlete, hard worker, just, you know, he, he did very well with pain and he did, you know, very well you know, with suffering. And I said, Hey, you, you're you know, too stubborn, too stupid in tennis to change anything technically. But I said, now you need to learn how to swim. So he, 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 he had done, he had done really well financially. So he went to mission Viejo and I remember going to this place where they developed national champions in mission Viejo. So, well, I just go and hang out, ask for permission. I'm a tennis coach at the Vic Braden Tennis College, which is just right around the corner. And I said, I don't know anything about swimming, but there's this place in Mission Viejo that's developing national champions. Why don't you go there and learn how to swim? And that's what he did. And then within, wow. two, within two years, he was in the top 10 in Great Britain in as a triathlete. Wow. But did, well, did you take lessons? Did you get, you know, did you I work did. On the technique? Yeah. 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 It's such as, is anything. I mean, even running and, and cycling, uh, um, it's so technique based and eat, but even more so there's just so much drag and water is a thousand times more dense than air, you know? So it really is, um, <laughs> something that you got to spend a lot of time doing. And it's amazing that he was able to do that in such a short time. I mean, two years sounds like a long time, but that's short to get that good in swimming. If you're not, coming from a swimming background like Jan, you know? Yeah. With, um, 25 years, you've been into it now. So, uh, yeah. Tell us about, uh, the different types of, uh, triathlons, everything up to the Ironman. 
yeah. So there's just all kinds of different distances that we've got a great one here in Austin called the rookie try. And, and it's like a 200 meter swim and a 10 mile bike and like a two mile run. And so it's a great way to get into it, you know, but yeah. The, and then every, every step up, we've got the sprint triathlon, which is generally a, you know, an 800 or half mile swim and a, 12 mile bike and a 5k and then you have what they call the olympic distance which is the distance they use for the olympics and that's a mile swim and roughly like a 40k bike maybe roughly 24 mile bike and then then a 10k run and then um you get the long distance stuff and that's like the um iron man half iron mans and those are now branded 70.3 and so that's 73, 70.3 miles worth of stuff. And so that's a little over a mile swim and then a 56 mile bike and then a half marathon. So 13 miles roughly of that. And then you got the, the full distance and a, a long uh, course is what some people call it, but the full Ironman, um, you know, almost more than a two mile swim and then. 112 miles on the bike and then a full marathon, uh, 26.2 on the marathon. So uh, lots and lots of fun there. And then they do have ultra um, ones too that are just insanity. And I've got a buddy that does those things. And they're three-day events, Steve. The first day is a 10K swim. So 6.2 miles swim. I, I'm not going to get all these distances correct. But then the next day is like a, um, like it's a 200 some mile bike. It's insanity. Plus a run. Sometimes they add a run on the second day. And then the third day is a double marathon. Oh, I, I never would do anything like that, but a double marathon. And most of the time, Steve, the, ter- the the race directors for those events, you know, you can't, you know, it's so expensive to block off roads and have police, at, uh, you know, blocking off the roads. So sometimes for those ultra distance ones that are so long, they have to do them like on a high school track and in a park um, course to where you're doing like loops of like four miles for 200 total miles it's just unbelievable the the excruciating amount of mental and physical uh fortitude that these people have to have to do that yeah. but i've done two iron man distance and i've done like two half iron man I've, i don't do great in in those guys but i definitely shine more in the off-road stuff the shorter stuff and the and the off-road stuff let me uh throw this in a little inside uh scoop with uh dave anderson who's been on our podcast a couple times he's out in dallas so uh the event that you've won national titles in you and anderson are going to show up how bad are you going to beat him he's just going to show up and he's going to go for it i mean is he going to is he are you going to be done and he's still going to be in the water i mean how's that going to play out oh he'll be on the bike he'll be out of the water but he'll he won't he won't hit the run by the time I'm done. I guarantee it. Now, with his confidence level, there's a follow-up question. So he's, I'm going to ask him, uh, you've been doing it for 25 <laughs> years. How, how long is it going to take him to uh, to beat you? How, how many years would he have to train? And You know, he might say minutes. Uh, what, what do you think? I think that it'll take him a roughly 10 years. And I'm only saying that because I'll be 70 in 10 years and I will maybe not even to be able to eat soup uh, at that age. So who knows? No, I'm just having some fun. <laughs> inside, inside joke, inside <laughs> comment. Um, tell us about uh, everything from uh, rest, sleep, diet, weight training, flexibility, um, testing, what, what, what a typical day for uh Mike Carter, the athlete. Okay. Um, yeah, the testing thing, I haven't done a test in a long, long time, but it's something that I'm going to go back and do because I feel like at, 
our age, and um, it, it's important to stay fit and fast, not just in shape. I think some studies definitely show that if you've got a solid, low, uh, strong um, heart rate and VO2 max, um, it's really important to do that. So high intensity doesn't have to be long. Um, it can be relatively short, but high intensity bursts of exercise is uh, really important. Whether it be a fart lick, which is just kind of running fast when you feel like it and slowing down when you don't, um, that kind of an exercise, whether that's running or biking or whatever it is, could be in the pool, but really important to have high intensity if for youth as well, youngsters as well, but high intensity bursts all the time. But particularly as we age, we need to be doing that. So for me, I, I eat so many green things. It's amazing. I try to be as colorful as possible, but you'd be shocked at the, the amount of vegetables that we eat. We're literally just trying to be as healthy and, and live as long as we can possibly live. That's our one goal. I say our, cause Diane and I are both plant-based, um, I'll eat a piece of fish here and there, um, especially on vacation. Difficult to kind of do that, you know, plant-based 100% when you're, when you're traveling around, but definitely plant-based and, and do that. But my swim and biking and my running um, is always has bursts of as hard as I can possibly go for certain amounts of time, short amounts of time, and then rest and recovery. Um, the, stretching the flexibility has been a, a game changer for me. Um, running is, uh, super pounding and very difficult and, and can be difficult for some in terms of just the, the, the wear and tear and everything. For me, I've been super lucky to be able to keep doing it at the rate that I can and for as long as I can. Um, but that, uh, but it, it, it almost stopped and the flexibility of my, my, daily stretching has been huge and you can do it while you're on the computer. You can do it while you're on the phone. I've done it a few times while we were talking. And for me, it's just a, it's a piriformis muscle in my left butt cheek that <laughs> won't let my left hip work. And so while you're stretching your left piriformis, why not stretch everything else? And so that's what I, I do. And I highly recommend um, kiddos, uh, starting on their flexibility ASAP. And so that's really it for me in terms of what I do. Um, I will be getting a VO2 max here in the next uh, few weeks, uh, test just so I can have another gauge of where I was, uh, for where I am now. Um, and, uh, something that I can look forward to doing once a year. And then, um, but I think the, the, the plant base has been huge. I haven't lost any weight. I haven't needed to lose weight. Oh, and I forgot, Steve, sorry, but weightlifting, especially at our age, but, um, you know, we lose so much of our, um, VO2 max, but also our muscle mass as we age. And, uh, um, you know, just super important for all of us to be doing a, having a great, at least three times a week routine that you do, um, that, that, obviously includes stretching, but, but strength training, it could be high reps, low weight. That would be my recommendation for endurance athletes and tennis players. Um, but, uh, some people just love to put on that muscle. Some people aren't able to put on very much muscle like me. Um, but I'm definitely, uh, I've stayed kind of fit and strong just because I've kept up with the weights. And so that's, that's kind of the, 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 Four keys, I think, is the high intensity, a good plant-based diet, or at least a lot of vegetables, and then um, your strength stretching and your strength training. And do you have a, a gym at your house? I uh, we do we do have some things at the house, but really we love the gym that we go to. So and it's relatively close, about fifteen minutes away. It's got a pool. It's got a neat uh, lake in the back for open water swimming. And then it's got all the fancy machinery and all that stuff. And it's got great classes, too. It's got great 
spin classes and then other strength training classes that we partake in and then yoga too if you happen to do that i i was taught by a, a person who teaches yoga how to stretch and so i just do my own yoga routine um but yeah that's long way to answer your question but yeah we don't generally do it at home we try to get out of the house and go to that gym because it's so awesome mike inspiration carter so it's a family affair your wife is uh does she compete as well she um she did one triathlon and was on the podium her first and only triathlon but she she doesn't swim anymore she rides her bike a lot and she runs a little bit and she does, and she's a gym rat. I mean, she is literally, she's the one that got me into strength training, Steve. I mean, when I met her, you should, uh, she's still like the picture of fitness for a 60, almost 61 year old. I guess she is 61. She's 61 years old. She is the picture of fitness and uh, she's got muscles on muscles and she looks great. And it's all because she, she just stays dedicated to it. But she was the one that, you know, I was, you know, teaching tennis and then going, you know, to her apartment and eating two Domino's pizzas back then. And <laughs> she was, um, I'm not kidding. That's, this is what I, and then just what, however many beers I could drink. And, uh, we've since changed that, <laughs> that habit. And I'm, I'm doing a lot better now. <laughs> you got to still have a beer once in a while, though, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. 12 ounce curl, 12 ounce curl, low to high swallow, low to high swallow through <laughs> And, and your daughters, do they, uh, um, how about where they are with this fitness? Is it, so they, did they jump in line and do this whole thing too? They, they didn't, Ryan, the oldest, who's about to have a baby may have had a baby. I don't know. We'll see. Um, she, I hope, um, I she, wait for this podcast. I hope to be not over. too. Wait for the podcast to be over. <laughs> um, she, uh, was a real competitive gymnast and got into the, she was an elite gymnast and um, man, she was doing literally six days a week, four to eight hours a day gymnastics and then went uh, uh, and then did some cheer and then was a cheerleader in college at Baylor University. Um, she was one of the flyers, you know, the people they throw up in the air and she does a bunch of twists and then they catch them. Um, most of the time they catch him, they did drop her once and she got a concussion. Um, I never will forget that. Um, but yeah, so that was her fitness and she played high school tennis. So she, she loved tennis and they're now members. She and her husband are members at Brookhaven and, and they both play golf and they both play tennis and they both play pickleball. So it's good stuff. And she's, she's super fit. And then the, the youngster that's in law school, she's, um, Riley is her name. And she was a, State doubles champ for private schools. I think it was called TAP, T A A P S. And so, yeah, she won state doubles. She was about, you know, three foot two tall and <laughs> just the tiniest little thing. But, Steve, I think even you would be pretty impressed with that girl's stroke reduction, man. She, she had it. She loved it. And she, She's not playing right now. She is going to the gym, but uh, I'm hoping that she gets back uh, on the tennis court. <laughs> Carter, Carter, Carter. Um, yes, no, sir. It's, it's fantastic. It's great to have you on this podcast. We need to do round two. I mean, uh, the, the notes that you sent me, we haven't even scratched the surface on these. All right, now. Um, but um, and I, I do, once again, hope that uh, um, – the stork, the, the baby's delivered uh, after the podcast. But Carter, the grandfather, <laughs> Carter, the grandfather. Grand, Crazy. Grand story about the triathlon. So one thing I need to bring up, though, is music. Uh, yeah. Doug Tomlin, who went through tennis tech, <laughs> and was in, in, in the band with you. He always told yeah. me, when you talk to Carter, tell him, because listeners, uh, you need to know that Carter's a drummer. And... Uh, <laughs> Tomlin's got some great lines. I'd love to listen to his, uh, some of his jokes and such. He said, tell Carter that drummers like to hang out with musicians. <laughs> and uh, tell, tell us just a quick overview on uh, music. Uh, what's going on with the, the Carter band today? Yeah, so that's a lot of fun. <clears throat> um, I have a crazy band right now that... Uh, 
we're called sloppy foot and we we've never even seen each other steve we don't even know what we look like we've never talked to each other um voice to voice what we do is we share files music files um through dropbox and through uh what's that today what's that app and and then we send them all to this guy and he puts them all together and makes a song and out of it and uh um, I'll do some acoustic guitar and I'll do all the lyrics and the singing and, uh, and they do, they're the real stars of the show though. I mean, they literally are professionals. They are very, very good at what they do. I can't believe they allow me to be around them. Um, but, or at least maybe because we're virtual, they let me hang out that way. But, um, that's what we do. We've done almost, we're working on our seventh album each album has about 12 songs so um so it's uh not stuff that you're probably it some of it's kind of heavy some of it's a little heavy some of it's uh really long songs but they're all excellent because of those guys and then i just kind of uh do what i can do but yeah doug uh tomlin you know we were in a band together and i that's when i i didn't know how to play guitar now i do and i write my own little acoustic songs and so maybe we'll do some more unplugged type stuff uh, later with with some of those little songs that I write. But uh, yeah, that was those were good times with Doug and, and Tyler in that band. That was a lot of fun. We actually came to Austin and played. Tom is a great guy, great father. He is. No one loves your kids more. He's got some more, good players. More huh? than Doug Tomlin. Um, yeah, with they're getting better. You keep putting putting the hours in. Um, Mm-hmm. With, with um where are the members of the band from um we got one guy in scotland of all places um and the other dude is we lost our new york guy which is is unfortunate but not a a problem because the guy from arizona is both of them are so multi-instrumental um that they they can do it all and so um I don't even do the drums for this. We just use a drum machine, which will make some drummers just want to punch me in the face. But um, it's just way quicker just to do it that way. But yeah, so so Arizona and Scotland and then Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. Hey, this has been phenomenal <laughs> listening to you, Carter. I have to say this. Uh, um, Michael Center, he allowed us to do this. We had a, we had a workshop at UT. University of Texas. Yeah. And uh, your wife came in for just a few minutes um, at the end. And I said, well, we can't ask her. We have to ask Andy. Your brother Andy was there. And I said, let's go through this. And uh, when I first met Mike Carter, he had no personality. Like I started the podcast. (laughs) Couldn't smile, couldn't laugh. And uh, I said, the person who can verify, the person who can verify these statements is the person who's known him the longest. And that was Andy. And Andy just nodded and he goes, he goes, yeah, he had no personality. Anyway. uh, And Andy's all these years later, he's still at the same club, right? He is. He's yeah. Harlington country club, uh, grinding it out and loving it. He just loves it. No, Andy, uh, I have my Andy Carter stories. I remember, uh, (laughs) <laughs> you know, Mike goes through the program first and the little brother goes through it second. And I, call, I was calling him Carter number two. And he's very quiet. And he <laughs> says, uh, could you just call me Andy? And I said, okay, Carter. <laughs> oh, okay, Carter number two. <laughs> but uh, no, he sent me a few, several players over the years. And actually at one time, maybe they still do. They still have the pro tournament? Yeah, he just finished it. And he, he was just telling me yesterday that Bernard Tomich uh, That's right. was in the finals. Okay. Yeah. And lost, oh, I can't think of who it was, but a young, younger American. So Tomich is there and they're like best buds. They're going to go golf. And then he might stay at my house while the baby, grandbaby's being born and we're in Dallas. Bernard Tomich might, I just, I don't know. He's a temper, doesn't he? I don't want him to break anything, but he's <laughs> welcome to the house if he wants. It's because because there's a another 25k in Austin in a week or two. 
No, I, I, so read, I, read, come to I, I read that he played. I didn't make the connection that he was playing at Andy's place. But with yeah, that, with Andy's uh, place. Yeah, Andy's housed a lot of players I sent down there. Um, my son played there. Uh, your son? I saw your son play. He was awesome. With uh, You could tell that he uh, had gone through some of the tennis tech training, correct? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need Confirmed. The, you need to get the racket below the ball. But no, it's, it's uh, you know, our listeners know this. When you've known somebody a long time, it's, it's, it's amazing. It just takes a minute to catch up. But I really mm-hmm. uh, appreciate you being a guest. Uh, and let's do it again. Now uh, we'll come back to some of these notes. But uh, Mike Inspiration Carter, that's your new middle name. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely pick up my fitness uh, starting tomorrow morning. With uh, I love it. The, uh, <laughs> All right, Carter. Thank you so much. It's been great. We'll do it again. Oh, it's an honor to, to talk with you. And thank you so much. And I hope we can do it again. All right, Carter. Adios, amigos. All right. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, bye. All right. Thank you, Mike Carter. Uh, podcast 116 is in the books. Uh, fantastic conversation. You got to love Carter. There's only one Carter. He broke the mold. Anyway, to next time, thanks for listening. Great Base Tennis Podcast.